first thing is to review and approve the agenda, which seems not terribly long today. Don't want to mm. don't want to jinx it, you know. But um, we'll see. <laughs> um, any adjustments to the agenda? That's fine to me. Okay. Um, so with that, we will consider the agenda approved. Uh, so on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on a topic. Um, otherwise not on our agenda. And if you would keep your comments to about two minutes, that'd be very helpful. Also say your name and uh, where you live. And that, uh, that applies to all the comments generally. Um, it's a pretty small crew here, but uh, um, you know, the general guidelines anyway. Um, anyone want to address the council? Uh, yes, go ahead, Lauren. Yeah, thanks. So just wanted to, uh, because I am running for re-election to represent District 1, just wanted to take a moment to just acknowledge it's been such an honor and privilege to work with everyone. I hope to get another chance uh, by getting re-elected and would love to have people's votes, uh, but just wanted to take a minute at the beginning. It's been really just incredible to see the dedication and hard work of the mayor, of every city councilor. It's been such a pleasure working with everyone on through you know these really incredibly hard times um, and the city staff, just, just seeing how dedicated everyone is to trying to make our community as good as possible and navigate through all of this. It's just been such an honor and um, you know, hope to have the chance to keep building on the work we've been doing to to help our community and build increase equity and address climate change and other important priorities. Um, but just want to take a minute, uh, in case it is my last meeting, to thank everyone and acknowledge um, what a what an honor it's been and and what a pleasure and and to thank you all. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, um, anyone else? And Cameron, you're not seeing anybody. No, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So um, we will keep going then. Um, all right. So on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Yeah. Go I ahead, move. Jack. I move the consent agenda. Second. Uh, John, did you? And uh, so the motion in a second. Um, John, did you want to say anything about it? Let's see how you turn your camera on there. Ooh, I'm dark. Just that for whatever reason, no liquor license applications showed up in the last week, which is weird, but just so y'all know. Okay. Um, I don't have any um, objection to uh, this item, but I do have a question about the um, COVID-19 update. So wondering, um, uh, yeah, so Cameron, um, I saw as a part of the guidelines there, you know, there's no multifamily gathering indoors or outdoors. Um, but I, I will say that I'm confused about that part in relation to uh, recreation. I thought there was a, like an exception for recreation with like one family, but I, I wanted to- I believe it is. It is out, uh, it is further in the ACCD um, safe, big, like the opening guidance um, where there is an exception for outdoor recreation for unvaccinated families who can gather. Um, I'd have to look up the wording specifically for that. Um, it, they're talking the main guidance that came out was about indoor gatherings. Right. You know, I was I was looking at the ACCD stuff and it was kind of confusing, like which one confusing. is, you know, governing the situation here. So um, yeah, that might be useful to folks just to have clarity about that. But that's all. I'll add some clarity fine language in our weekly report. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, any further comments? Okay, so there's a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed? Okay, so the consent agenda passes. Um, so moving on to a presentation on uh, the dispatch uh, console. So for this, I assume I'm turning things over to uh, Chief Pete and um, also potentially Fred Cummings. Good evening, Madam Mayor, uh, members of the City Council. Uh, good, good, good evening. Uh, thank you all very much again for the opportunity to be here. The uh, what we'd like to do is just provide a little bit of information, um, summarize information on the dispatch console 
systems that we were looking at, uh, especially uh, of the, the previous questions uh, that were revolving around it. Uh, with me uh, is uh, Dispatch Supervisor Fred Cummings. And so he and I are going to both be providing the presentation, uh, though Fred is probably gonna do most of the talking with some time to time input for myself. So if I may, I'm gonna share our screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes, we can. All right, great. I'll move that to, looks like it's not allowing me to go to, yep, there we go, okay. So again, my name is Brian Peed. I'm with the uh, Montpelier Police Department as the chief, and uh, we're here today to talk to you about the uh, our dispatch consoles. And these are gonna be the points that we'll be talking about, uh, uh, discussing what dispatch is, the purpose of the consoles, what our current consoles are, their capability, their operability, and the challenges that we have with them, um, what our proposed dispatch console system is, um, how that new system will fit into our future anticipated needs to include the, uh, the upcoming study with the CGPSA. And then we'll again talk about those regional studies and compatibility and then we'll sum everything up. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, a dispatch supervisor coming. Good evening. Um, so basically the job of dispatch is to handle all of the incoming calls and all of the radio communications from Montpelier, uh, police, fire, and EMS, Capital West, Capital Police. And we also do the after hours emergency uh, calls for DPW. Um, last year, dispatchers in Montpelier handled 13,181 calls. <clears throat> Capital West does contract with us um, for 24 hour, 365 day a year coverage. And the current contract is calling for $389,041. So basically, if you look at this picture, the computer screen on the very right with the red on the top of it, um, that's actually what the dispatcher sees as far as the radio console. The other three screens that are in front of that run our um, Valcor, um, our open Fox through the state system to run plates and stuff through the national database. And I can't see what is on the other, other screen, but it's typically um, the active 911 screen um, that allows us to, to see where units are, or it's the GPS screen um, so we can see where the cruisers and, and, and stuff like that are. Um, so this, this radio technology, what you're going to see some pictures of in a, in a few minutes, um, what it actually looks like outside of dispatch. Um, this is all the dispatcher sees is this console right here. And that's, that's, that's pretty much what, what they use to make it work. So how did we get here? So you'll see a circle on the bottom here. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to talk to um, Dan the other day. Um, basically what happened to start this conversation off was this unit that's circled on the bottom of the, of the screen actually controls our um, VSP state two and sheriff's department um, um, radio um, through the console. Basically that unit failed and it's over 20 years old. Burlington Communications did their best to try to fix it. Um, it wasn't fixable. The current unit that's circled right there, they actually found at Milton PD up in Northern Vermont and it's on loan to us to make our radio system work. So that spawned a, a bigger discussion about continuity of operations and, and, and what happens you know, when, when our radio systems go down. Um, so I started to look into the possibility of getting a laptop based console so that we could leave here in the event of an emergency and still have full radio capabilities. It was at that point that I realized that that wasn't something that we could do with the current radio consoles that we have. And I also found out that the current radio consoles that we have um, have just about lived out their useful life. Um, they're no longer supported by Motorola. I'll talk a little bit about that in a future slide. 
But that's, I want you to understand that's how we got to the console discussion was actually by having a unit upstairs fail. Um, and so part of the part of the money that was requested through the budget process was actually these units have to be replaced upstairs. Um, that's $38,000. And then the rest of the money that, that we had asked for is actually to replace and upgrade the consoles. So Brian can go to the next slide. So basically, if you look to the, to the left, there's a red circle around three boxes. This is in the basement. These are actually the brains of the consoles um, for all three that we currently have. Um, there's one at each dispatch console desk. This is what makes them run. It has cards in them um, that, that can pretty much fail at any time as we learned in 2019. Um, we did have a failure. Um, and then where it says Bramic over here, the, there's actually a hard drive that sits behind this, this under the desk um, that actually controls the computer screen that you saw earlier. So that's pretty much what the console system looks like. It's basically a three part um, piece of equipment. So in 2015, our current consoles, which are which I refer to as Motorola 5500s, that's their model number. They were purchased at a cost um, between 200 and 210,000. Um, that money came from a VCOM grant that Chief Fakos was able to get the city of Montpelier. So there was no cost to the city of Montpelier for those consoles. Um, when I was hired, we purchased a third console, um, which CVPSA was able to, through Paco to get another VCOM grant. So our current consoles, there was no cost to the city of Montpelier at all um, for the equipment. Um, when these were purchased in 2015, they replaced Orbicom consoles that were that were many years old, which Chief Fakos told me the other day actually were actually purchased on a grant as well. So for the last 20 something years, um, the consoles that have been used um, by MPD and and Capital West for, for that matter, um, there has been no cost to the city at all. They've all been purchased through grants. Unfortunately, there's no longer or currently a grant available that will fund this equipment. So that's why we went through the budget process this year and ex explained the need of, of why we need to upgrade the consoles. Um, so in 2019, one of these boards that circled went bad in one of the consoles. In 2019, Motorola discontinued the 5500 console that we currently have now. At the end of this year, 2021, they no longer support it. What that means is that as parts go bad or as we need parts, we have to scour the country to try to find somebody that has them. Um, that's, that's not a good position to be in. I, this is actually a good time. I, I told Chief Pete I was going to bring this up to, to try to make everybody understand what it means to lose a piece of equipment. Um, today was one of the busier, busier days that our dispatch centers had. We had two um, huge building fires um, today, one in Middlesex and one in Waitsfield. Um, and we had a multitude of other calls. One of our computer workstations actually crashed today. Not the radio console, just the computer workstation. What that means is that we, we had a dispatcher that couldn't do their job um, in, in the Valcor system and everything else. And I bring that up because if the radio console had failed, we would, we would be faced with the same thing that, that the dispatcher doesn't have the ability to actually talk on the radio. Um, that's why this, this replacement system is, is very much needed because we, we, we need to know that if it, if it crashes, I mean, they're currently still working on the computer workstation, um, but, but if it, if it crashes, we need to know that we can get it back up and running really, really soon um, because these are vital, vital operational needs of the department. Or for the Brian's next, going to talk about this. And I can jump in and Fred will, Fred will probably uh, come back on me uh, to, to, to just uh, make me sound smart. But basically the, the new dispatch console system that we're looking at is the Motorola 7500 IP. Um, the IP just pretty much stands for the uh, the uh, internet surfacing uh, or internet protocol, which allows it, you know, just 
just allows it to operate over, over the internet. Brett can talk more about that. Uh, what the highlights for this system are, are, are effective secure communications. Um, the uh, Premier CAD system is, which is a next generation 911 call control. Uh, it, it helps in computer aid dispatch with a CAD system, uh, which allows the, the system to interface with our records and case management system to provide more information to the dispatchers and, and who are gonna funnel that information to the officers that are out there in the field. Um, it has a record suite for database management, which again is that records integration with our current system, as well as what, what the dispatchers are gonna see, as well as a jail application. Uh, the moto mapping feature that, uh, that it boasts is again, it's another one of those officer tracking things that it can superimpose a map of the, of the area, of our city, of any of the areas that we might have um, mutual aid agreements with and show you where the officers are at those particular locations. Uh, and then the API is short for an application programming interface, which pretty much gives it the, the, uh, the programs, the ability to interact with other software systems or resources so that they can guide in, so they can go in through those back doors uh, to bring out, to funnel out information, to fully integrate the dispatch console system itself with any of the other programs that we're operating with for dispatch. And if Fred, if there's anything else that you'd like to, uh, to discuss about this? No, I think I think you pretty much hit it. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about continuity operation, um, but some of the things that as as we're dealing with now, um, again, we just had a, had a systems crash with our computer system. One of our uh, just basically one of the dispatch computer systems, and we effectively were down to two. And uh, so when we're looking at things like what OSHA has been saying about shelter in place, uh, some, some things from uh, CISA about um, 911 center pandemic recommendations, uh, what happens if we have an emergency, especially in light of the current climate that we're dealing with uh, regarding uh, government. Uh, again, weather in the storm and communications, looking at some of the things even now in Texas, what they're dealing with when their systems go out. Uh, and again, mentioning uh, what our current climate and threat level is uh, within the city, again, had, gives us a real concern for continuity of operation. Well, yeah, Fred can talk to this part here. Okay, so this, this new system um, would be the same three consoles that we have in dispatch, um, obviously the new ones. And it also includes a, a laptop console where if something happens in the dispatch center, we have the ability to take the laptop and go anywhere that we want to go and still be able to control our radios, just like we were sitting at our desks. Um, one of the other big features of this, Barry City is actually looking at the same console system, the three plus one. Um, so we would be able to connect them a little bit differently than we connect them now on the bridge. Um, and, and they would actually be fully functioning um, our dispatchers could literally sit down over there and do the same things that they could do here if, if, if that became a necessity. Um, that, that might just have a little right now. That's a, that's a, that's a huge deal. Um, the 7500 is upgradable, which our current console obviously is not. They discontinued it. Um, and we expect them to last 10 to 15 years. Um, you know, Motorola will handle all the design, engineering, and installation of the new system. They actually send their people here to do it. Um, and then it's maintained by Burlington Communications, who's the Motorola dealer in our area. And, and one thing to tap on about that, that there is the RFP process for something like this. In the state of Vermont, there are only, in general, there are only a handful of agencies that provide this type of equip communications equipment. Motorola being the top number one in the game. So uh, it, it's not that it's something that we can send out like an RFP process because everything is going to go back to Burlington Communications for the most part, because they're the only service provider in the area that can do this kind of work. So I know there have been some questions about the, the compatibility. Hey, Fred. Uh, sorry, yeah. Fred, just from the last slide before it, it goes too far, I had one quick question. Be, when you say potentially connect with Barry City, could you just explain how we're currently connected to so Barry we City? Have, 
we currently have a bridge system between the two. So Barry City does not have the same type of console system we have. Um, they have a Zetron system, um, which is which is slightly different, and it's reaching its end of life. Um, and so our only way to connect to them currently is is through a is through a fiber bridge. And and like anything else, I mean, if the fiber goes down, it, it doesn't work. Um, and the other the other disadvantage I think for us is that. I even probably couldn't go and sit down at their console and operate it as seamlessly as I do these consoles. Zetron is, is a completely different platform um, and it functions um, much differently than, than Motorola does. Um, you know, I have been over there to look at it. I still don't completely understand it. Um, I could probably, you know, fight my way through it and, and, and figure it out. But, um, you know, there, there, are, there are huge benefits to, to both cities being looking at these at the same time, right? So um, I, when it says potentially, it's because if Barry City doesn't buy the consoles um, right now, we would still connect through the bridge that we have currently. That's in place. Um, the, the benefit if they go with this system, um, even in the future is that we can connect a little bit differently so that it's, it's more seamless than through the bridge that we currently have. Um, but that's that's the only option that we have currently, and and so I'm hoping that they m move the same way and get the same type of consoles. That's a huge thing for the continuity operations, as far as I'm concerned. Can I follow up with a question, Fred? Absolutely. Um, I guess I'm just a little confused because I thought when the Public Safety Authority bought consoles and did some work to try to make Barry and Montpelier redundant from one another, what you're telling me that's really only was a bridge more than really redundancy so that dispatchers couldn't move between the two stations, but one could take over for the other. Right, so I could, I have the ability right now, if Barry goes down, I can control their, um, I can control their radios and vice versa, right? Through this bridge. When, when the CVPSA did a console upgrade, it was Paco, getting a grant for the third console at Montpelier PD. Um, the only the only console that you could buy at that point was another 5,500 because the, the consoles have to be the same. Um, it's unfortunate that, that they were discontinued as quick as they are or, or were, um, but the other thing that the authority helped with was was establishing the bridge between the two places, the right. fiber bridge. Yes. So, so I can sit at my desk and I can control Barry City's towers and vice versa. The difference is, is that the Motorola platform is really easy to use. I, I've used several different systems. I've never used a Zetron system. Um, so I, one of our dispatchers couldn't just go there and sit down at their console and be able to operate it seamlessly, right? Um, right. And so okay. for continuity of operations, that's why I, I really hope that Barry City goes to the same type of platform, which I think they're going to. I mean, I can't speak for them, but... Um, I think that's the direction that they're moving in. So um, it, it will be much more seamless. Then I could actually put one of our dispatchers in Barry City and they would have the same platform there to operate. And that's what we don't have right now. Okay. The other thing is about the number. It says 7,500. <clears throat> Does that relate to like a 700 megahertz? No, that's just a model number, Donna. So what is the megahertz? I was trying to find it here. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't have the technical specifications in front of me, so, and I wouldn't even want to broach that, so. Well, one of the things that came up with our recent vendors that we were interviewing to do the assessment study yep. was that the 55s, they feel, was a very low megahertz, and really one of the things- This doesn't have anything to do with megahertz. This is just a model number. Okay. Well, so, so I, I guess I thought- that was really an important factor to try to move to get closer to 800 megahertz in new systems. Oh, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about, you're talking about radio frequencies. 800, right. mega, that, 800 megahertz is a trunking system. Yeah. So, okay. Right. So, so that's a completely different conversation than, than the consoles. You, the consoles will ha have the capability to, to do multiple bands of, of radios. 800 megahertz refers to it's a, the easiest way to describe it is it's a digitally scrambled um, 
trunking system, meaning that you have multiple platforms of multiple channels that you can select from, right? So, right. so that's not something that as of right now, um, I, I don't see that we would potentially move to that because the only, the only system currently that could theoretically move to that would be police because they're on UHF and, and, but they're, but they're in the, in the 400 megahertz area, which is pretty common for the state of Vermont and a lot of other places. Right. So di digital trunking in the 800 megahertz spectrum is actually pretty common in big cities where you need multiple, multiple platforms and multiple trunk channels for, for, for a lot of different things. It's not something that is probably going to, based on what my knowledge, it's not something that's going to be brought into Vermont anytime soon. Uh, thank you, because what you just shared with me clarified my question. I know we may not be interested in the trunking, although that's something being considered with lots of other stuff. I guess I was just wanting to make sure that the consoles could handle any kind of upgrade like 800 Absolutely. megahertz. With Absolutely. Radio. That's one of the reasons why we looked at the 7500 um, was that it is, and, and Brian can go to the next slide because this this probably will tie into um, what I'm going to say now. So I know there were questions about the CVPSA study and what the outcome is going to be. Um, you know, the Capital West proposal for what they want to do with voted simulcast. And then there's also the the Barry City Montpelier, we call it the dual city proposal, which is yeah. which is creating a system just for Barry City and Montpelier. And so so all of these kind of operate in parallel to each other, right? And and the, the console system is an operational department need. It's going to have no impact because anything that comes out of the CVPSA study, for example, will will be able to be integrated into these consoles because these consoles are IP based. So if we decide later on that we want to integrate some LTE and broadband technology a few years down the road, these consoles have that capability, right? So so we were we were trying to be very forward thinking and when we when we looked at these consoles because I know that the CVPSA study is going to come out with some stuff that's probably going to try to take effect in the next five years, right? As far as broadband and LTE as that gets built out. So we wanted consoles that were that were compatible with that, right? We don't want to we don't want to get into a position again where where we have consoles that aren't capable of doing that. Right. Remember right. I said in the beginning right. that, that, that was that was the whole thing that sparked this was was that equipment upstairs and then the fact that we can't get laptops to do what we want to do, right? So so we were very aware of, of all of these proposals that are currently operating in parallel, you know, the study and, and, and the other two proposals. So, so this isn't going to impact any of that. Anything, anything that comes out of that study that the two cities or, or Capital Fire choose to implement, these consoles will support that. Well, actually, it's going to help these studies because you're telling me it can support all these various possibilities, and that's good. Correct. Just one other question, and it's really more, I wish the Motorola salesperson was here. Um, you're saying, or they're saying 10 to 15 years. I thought the current system had like a 10 year life and we got six out of it. So how do you okay. trust that? Yeah, so, so you gotta understand that these radios were purchased on a grant back in 2015. My guess is with not having the, the institutional knowledge is the grant was only for a certain amount of money. They were able to buy these consoles for the amount of money that they had, which was a huge upgrade from the Orbicom system. Typically, and I, I can speak to the 7500 because I know several departments and, and dispatch centers that use them. Yeah. They are upgradable. So if they upgrade the if they upgrade the 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 software or anything else or, or whatever the case may be, they're they're gonna be upgradable. We Brian and I both talked to the Motorola rep. They'll be upgradable for the next 10 to 15 years. We don't see that this is going to be a problem. Okay, so when you say 10 to 15 year life expectancy, that means you expect to have upgrades. I understand. Okay. Yeah, there will be upgrades yeah. during that period, but but the platform won't, won't change. Okay. Will be able to handle them. Okay. Right, it'll Thank handle you. Very them. Helpful. Thank you. All right, so I think I just talked pretty much about this, that, that you know, this is a, this is a department operational need um, to, to have the consoles, and it's not going to impact any of these other parallel processes that are going on with other proposals and studies. So, 
I don't know, Brian. Do you want to talk about this or? Uh, well, I, I I can't go ahead, and I can uh, I can just uh, go from there. So so basically, in summary, dispatch is is act is very critical because it's the first point of contact for the citizens and the emergency rescue personnel. Um, you know, I was I was very grateful that I was able to spend some time with Dan the other day to actually show him some of the moving parts so that he could understand it. And and you know, I would encourage you know any of the council members if they want to see that I, Brian or I can more, more than more than willing to show you. Um, you know that we did get word from Motorola. Um, you know it was sent to to Bill, and um, you know these these consoles that we have now are no longer supported after 2021. Um, and so it it behooves us to have reliable equipment um, and and upgrading to a platform that is upgradable as time goes on and does allow um, the use of broadband and LTE and 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 other technology as we move forward and as those things evolve. So that's very important. Brian, you have anything else? No, I, I appreciate it. And, and so basically it's, uh, and, and we appreciate the diligence and the questions regarding the systems itself. But uh, our, our biggest looks were, were for continuity of operations and that's what sparked everything. It wasn't that we were, it wasn't that we were trying to go against anything that was going on. It was that we recognized that we're closing in on a potential failure that would be catastrophic for us. And that the system itself is an operational need and it's not gonna be something that's gonna have competing interests with what the CBPSA or what potentially uh, Capital West or, or even Barry for that matter may be looking at. We were looking for something that's gonna be robust, strong, and that's gonna be upgradable to all the potential variables that may come out uh, in, in, in the potential future. So with that, uh, uh, I, I think that concludes what we'd have to say. And, and if there are any questions, we, we stand ready to answer anything. Well, thank you so much. Um, I found this incredibly helpful. I feel like I have a much uh, better understanding of our system and where it's at and um, you know, the compatibility with uh, the future really, um, and as well as other cities. Um, so just one thing I want to um, note, I, I could picture someone coming in um, cold uh, from the, the public and uh, looking at, at this presentation and wondering what some of these things are. And it, it occurred to me that something that might be useful is like a glossary <laughs> of, of terms of like, so what, like what these acronyms are or how, um, how some of these things are um, linked with each other. Um, so anyway, just something to to consider. Um, but I, having said that, uh, I feel like I have uh, a much better understanding of what what these things are. So thank you. Um, other questions? Yeah, Connor, go ahead, and then Jack. Yeah, awesome presentation, guys. Really appreciate it. Um, you might have covered it as far as the upgrades. What kind of costs are associated with those? Or are those like built in on the um, initial price of the system there? So my understanding, talking to Motorola, and I'll get the firm answer, but any any software upgrades or, or things like that are pretty much included in their proposal for the system. Um, you know, if we had a if we had a hardware breakdown or, or one of the hard drives went in the in the console itself. That would that would be covered under warranty for I believe it's five years. Um, don't quote me on that either because I don't have that in front of me, Connor. Um, but the majority of the upgrades would be included in in what we're paying for the consoles. That's my understanding of it. I I can actually get that from the Motorola rep and forward it to the city council if you want. And, and if I may, sir, part of that was we didn't. The the intent wasn't we weren't trying to buy the system. We we had to do a quick get get a quick. Uh, dollar amount to help us factor into the potential budget. So we didn't take any deep dives with them because we had no promises that this was going to be something that we were going to purchase. So we just asked them for a, a, a number amount that we could try to squeeze it into the budget. That's great. Thanks so much. Jeff, go ahead. Thanks. I've got a couple of questions. Um, one is that, and I agree, I thought this was a great presentation. It was, I, I know more about this now than I did even reading the uh, PowerPoint before the meeting. It was very helpful to, to hear this. Um, when, when you say that Motorola after this year will not be 
supporting the 5500 system anymore, does that mean that not only will parts no longer be available, but also the uh, software will not be uh, supported and upgraded? Yes, that's correct. So basically what it means, Motorola, Motorola has a pretty set timeline when they discontinue something. They discontinued selling and, and making these consoles in 2019. Um, so they support it for two years after that. And what that means is that after they're done supporting it, we can't get parts from Motorola anymore. So we would then search the country and potentially try to find a used board or, or whatever the case may be and potentially be down for weeks until we find that, right? That's, that's the biggest fear um, because Motorola doesn't make the parts for them anymore. Once they, once they stop supporting it, you can't get the stuff from Motorola. Um, you know, these, these are not even upgradable like the 7500s are, you know, software or anything like that. Um, they, this is, you know, when I, when I talked to even, even some of the reps that sold these consoles, you know, these consoles were the least expensive consoles that Motorola made. And then after that, they made the 7500, which they made upgradable and and put a lot more features into um and yes they are more expensive um you know than than what what we bought these for in a grant but the end result is we're going to get a longer lifespan out of them um and 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 they are going to be upgradable so that's important i i agree that's important and it's it's been suggested to the council that uh if if anything broke down it would be an easy matter to go out and find replacement cards or drives or whatever would need to be done to uh, to keep the system going. Um, so, I, so, I, so I would I would agree and disagree with that. I, I would say that right now, while they're supported till the end of this year, that's probably true. But but after they're not supported, you have you have thousands of these in the country that are being used and the parts are going to become scarce and then you're going to get into trying to find a used board that maybe has been has been repaired by by an outside vendor and and who who knows how long that's going to work um you know that's that's something that from an operational standpoint you know not being able to talk to our units in the field or have them talk to us because our equipment's down because we can't find a part you know i use the equipment upstairs as a perfect example jack we have what started this whole conversation is we have that that radio equipment upstairs. It's over 20 years old. We can't even find parts for that anymore, you know, on the on on the market anywhere, which is why we had to borrow one from another police department to make it work. Right. That's not a position that we should be in with such a big operational piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. um, another question, and, and I think you've answered it, but maybe not in the way that I uh, grasp it and so I want to be clear I, I'm picturing you know we're we have a system you have a plan for where, where your system is going going to be going uh, uh, CVPSA is embarking on this study and uh, one of the concerns I have is that the outcome of that study might be that they're planning on going in a very different direction in terms of how they're going to design their dispatch system. Um, okay, so I guess, I guess, I guess what I would say is that my understanding of the CVPSA study, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, um, the CVPSA study is doing a study to to figure out what the what the equipment and, and technology and everything else is needed moving forward, and, and whether or not we try to, you know, combine dispatch centers or whatever the case may be, but. My understanding of the study is not that that we're going to create this new dispatch center somewhere else, right? You know, that may be one of the recommendations, but that's still that's still up to both the city of Montpelier and the city of Barrie to decide if that's a, a road that they want to go down. You know, these consoles, regardless of, of what direction we go in in the future, these consoles will be able to be moved to a potential new location, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the study, the study aside, we need the equipment to, to be operational here and, and not worry about it. Because even, even if that study turns around and says that, you know, we should merge, merge dispatch centers or we should create one big dispatch center for Washington County, 
that's that's still years down the road, right? It that's something that's going to have to be planned and 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 vetted out and fi figure out what the best way to to go about that is. So that's not something that's going to happen in the next six or eight months, which is when the support for these consoles runs out. And then and then the clock is ticking to see if we can actually find a part if we need a part, right? So so regardless of the outcome of the CVPSA study, what what that company that that's doing the the study says there are still going to have to be some some decisions made by the city by you as the city council and by Barry city council and everything else to decide if that's a road that you want to go down and and potentially give up your dispatch function right or 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 try to absorb absorb you know another dispatch center or whatever you want to do and put it in another location that doesn't change the operational need that we currently have for these consoles and then if I may, it's just, it, it's not going to affect the structural issues. CVPSA, to my knowledge, the, the program's looking at more of this, the structure, how, how the communications are going to come into the system itself. The console will be able to, to deal with anything, uh, any potential upgrades that, that, that the study would recommend. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Dan. Thanks. Um, let me maybe pick up that last thread. Um, and just ask an additional clarification question, which is, um, you know, is there a potential outcome to the CVPSA study that would not, in which these new consoles would either be a liability or potentially not called for in, in what the CVPSA is, is, uh, is studying with the Televate? I mean, that's, Dan, I, I can't see one because these these consoles, like I said, they're they're ten to a fifteen year console, and they're going to be movable. If we if we move into a new center and consolidate into a consolidated center, these consoles are able to be moved. Okay. So so I don't think there's any downside, and it actually puts us in a great position operationally to 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 move forward with good equipment. And and, and that's a good question, sir, because that was something that we we thought about ourselves and that we were presenting it to to, to Motorola itself when we were looking for the uh, the potential costs. Okay, so there's really no other way to design a system of dispatch without these consoles at the at the center of them, even if you know that we were either to change the location or um, change the system around. As you say, these can be added with LTE or um, any of the other upgrades that are available. That That's correct. Close those. Yeah. Um, and, and just so I can understand from a basic, and this is maybe to make sure I understand from our or observing these systems as well as your presentation, is you have the transmitters that are in the second floor. Um, and that's the one that actually gets the radio signal, right? And then the transmitter sends it to the console, which feeds it into the dispatch system. Basically, yeah. You, so you have transmitters and antennas on sites offsite here, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, one of the greatest functionalities is is the ability to make bring the system, you know, to another building, whatever the case may be, because everything connects by fiber and phone lines, right? So well, that, yeah, go ahead. So so the signal the signal does come into a, a, a radio receiver, right, which we have upstairs, right, through a, through a phone line, and and then we control we control the 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 voice and everything else through the console. So, so there's actually no quote unquote transmitters on site, right? They're okay. all, they're all in different locations outside of this building. But essentially, yes, sir, that, that, that's the gist of it. Okay. But I mean, those decks that you showed us at the beginning of the slide that are on the second floor, maybe I'm getting the nomenclature wrong, but it's, these are the um, receivers for the radio yes, signals. They're, they're radios. Radios, right. They are radios, yes. And, um, those are the ones that, that that we have that are going essentially at the end of their lifespan and starting in the one, for example, that you said is on loan from Milton. Um, those are the ones that have gone bad or That's started right. they reach the end of their life. Yeah. And and uh, stop me if I'm misremembering this, but is there could you upgrade or those receivers and not upgrade the console system? Well, yeah, but they're two completely separate things, Dan. So okay. the, the stuff upstairs has to be upgraded um, because it's well past its useful life. We can't find parts for it anymore. 
the the consoles are a different discussion. Okay. Um, the consoles are going to run out of support at the end of 2021, and that's what makes everything work. They're independent of each other, but they they need one another to sustain. Sure. No, I'm just trying to follow, and I apologize. I didn't take notes when we talked, so. I, oh, no, I, no, that's I okay. Me. It's good. We just don't um, want to over tech, uh, be over technical with it. Okay, and so, um, and I want to go back to the question I had before, just to maybe drive this home for my own understanding to make sure I'm not mis misunderstanding as well. The advantage of, of the IP is that it allows you to take the console system off the, the police station property if you needed to be a laptop or some other system, right? That's correct. And and right now, when you say a dedicated fiber, um, I'm visualizing an actual line that goes between our police station dispatch center and Barry. Is that accurate or is it just following on a cable yes, line? Yes, there is currently a line between the two. It, it's an E-line, but yes. Okay, so I mean, because we were talking before, I just wanna make sure, I, because I think it's an important point is that if anything happens to that E-line, car crashes into a telephone pole or something, that 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 line's cut, disrupted, and so is the bridge, right? Yes, that's correct. We would lose all functionality. Whereas with the IP system, there are the, all the connections that a network can make. Correct. Okay. Um, and then uh, sort of, my last question is is really about the the secondary market that that is the only way if if we don't upgrade to the seventy five hundreds, you're saying that Motorola is not making any new parts. If something breaks, if a motherboard, for example, goes, um, some some piece of equipment like that, the only way you can replace that is through the secondary market. And um, is there a uh, in a sense as to, you know, how robust that secondary market is, or, you know, the availability, is this something that's already starting to get tight as far as availability for parts? If I could take a quick step at, at first, uh, just from, from my perspective on the job, it, uh, so we, so any spare equipment that we might have down there, I'm not giving it to anybody else. So if, if another, if another organization calls and says, Hey, we know you have Motorola 5500s, we need X amount of, we need this piece. And, and if we did buy up a spare or we did look out and try to scrounge as much as we could, I, I probably wouldn't give it to them because at that point I wouldn't know if our system would fail nor because they're, they're so high dollar. I, I, I don't know if I'd be able to burden the city with an immediate request if something happened and I gave away the part. And Fred, if you wanna add to that. You, you're on mute, Fred. There's, there's thousands of these in use around the country, right? So, you know, as with anything else, I'm more comfortable if something comes from the manufacturer that makes the stuff every day mm -hmm. than I am getting something from a secondary manufacturer that may have fixed a board that was broke and may not work correctly, right? So, so you're, you're kind of at the, at the whim of, of secondary vendors and, and what kind of quality you're getting from them. I know that if I call Motorola right now, I'm getting a good quality product. That's gonna that's gonna work. It has a warranty behind it as well. Okay, um, thanks. That's that that's helpful, and I appreciate the uh, the presentation. I'll echo some of the other counselors' uh, gratitude for that. Thanks. Um, Lauren, go ahead, and then Donna. Yeah, I just just had a quick question. Um, and I know this was quite a while ago, but was just curious, like, if through the years it's been easy, or you've been able to secure grant funding, is there any timing issue here? Is, are those just no longer available? Is it, um, you know, if we waited a year, I mean, I'm hearing the, the time sensitivity and the urgency um, from you all of, of making sure that we're, we're doing this, but I was just curious if you know, if this is, um, if there's any opportunity for that kind of grant funding or if it's just totally dried up and there's nothing out there right now. So we're not, we're not seeing any right now. Um, Brian is very diligent about looking for grants as am I. 
um, if we do come across a grant that we think this this will fit into, we are absolutely going to apply for it. Um, and and we, I know Brian gets grant updates all the time, as do I. So I'm not saying that it's not coming down the pike. I don't know if it, if and when it's going to, um, but if it does, we are absolutely going to apply for it. Um, but it's like I said, it's an operational need that we need to replace soon, right? So. Um, we are going to continue to look for grant funding, but I'm not optimistic that we're going to find it very soon. And we have been, and we're, we're, we're especially robust and diligent in looking for them. Um, if, if the other opportunity that I'm looking at for, for this is, is it would be like a lease program. Um, if, if we could find grant funding in the future that would, that specifically aim towards something like this, I would definitely make sure that we put in for it that, so if we pay for the first year, and then we found grant funding that could help us pay for the remaining three or four years that we're going to uh, push this out for if the council allows us to purchase the, 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 the system, then we'll definitely get those grants so that we can minimize the cost to the city. Thank you. Um, Donna, go ahead. Um, uh, Brian, you mentioned about getting grants, but also I think you if you get this when this arrives and it sounds like it's a much better system expanded I have no conflicts with it I don't think what the public safety authority study will have any conflict I mean it's just one of another asset that we're going to be listing as our inventory but I, I do wonder about you know why don't you keep those parts and sell them on eBay <laughs> because a lot of us are good at using things used you buy them used. Uh, and so you may have some real gold there to help reduce the cost. But my other question was more of a contractual is whether or not any of the capital costs for this kind of upgrade going to be integrated into the contracts with Capital West. Uh, that That's a good question. I'll definitely lean on Fred to answer that one. But to my knowledge, no. The the, the only thing that, that Capital West is looking to make sure that we do is that we have the uh, is that we provide that communication service to them uh, to dispatch. So it, it's nothing, it's just something that we need to do to make sure that we're responsive to our responsibilities here, as well as to, to maintain the communications for our partners uh, going forward. So uh, I hope I didn't miss the mark on that, on, on your question. And, and, and Fred, if there's anything. No, so so taking Capital West out of it completely, right? The city still has a, a need to have console systems to even communicate with our police department, right? Um, the city's been fortunate that there has been grant funding for radio consoles for the last probably two decades and unfortunately we just can't find the funding right now um i think some of the radio operational costs are, are and i don't know this 100 percent because i wasn't involved in the in the last contracts but um i think as brian said part of what capital west pays for is is us having operational equipment to do our job and so I think there will be discussions moving forward as as far as, um, you know, there will be contract discussions that will take place with Bill and, and Brian, most likely with uh, with Capital West. That's not something I typically get involved in. Um, but I think that's one of the conversations that has to be had with them is that, you know, obviously there are costs associated with it and, and that has to be a negotiated thing. Because the financial aspect was one that bothers me and I know Tom Belanca really bothered him the whole financial outlay that Montpelier will do with just contracts versus the one role that we had hoped the public safety authority could do would be that financial binding place to have people committed to the capital as well as the service because it is it can't happen without it so just oh, keep that in mind that's all I, I agree 100 percent with that but but even if the contract were to go away. No, I, I understand that. You don't, you don't have to justify the expense. Right, right. I think you've got to jump to the other side and now be a salesperson for the people you're serving and say, hey, you got to help me pay for the bucket that's bringing you the water. Donna, I was never a salesman. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Oh, and, and um, I'm, just, I'm sorry, sorry, ma'am. If I may, uh, to Commissioner Hurl's uh, Hurl's point, uh, there is a, I have a, a meeting with the, uh, International Association of Emergency Managers, we're on a call for FEMA's upcoming grants. So if I'll ask that specific question and see if I can get some information to that. And if we can definitely do it through a FEMA grant, we will. I'm just anticipating that uh, some parts may become unavailable 
Um, is there is it too late to pre-order parts that are likely to fail? We we really don't know what would fail. That's the problem, right? So, I mean, I, I guess we could, but we're still we still run into the same problem that we don't have any real continuity of operations. We don't have the ability to take a radio console off site. Um, that's actually huge, especially with some of the stuff that's been going on in the country recently. I know Brian covered that in some of the slides tonight. Um, that's a that's a huge concern for me. I, I always joke with people, and, and I joked when we first brought this up about the laptop. I could literally sit in my living room and 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 dispatch calls, and you'd never know where I was. So, not that I'm going to take it home and do it for my living room, but um, we would have that capability. But you could if you had to. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's, that's good. Any any further um, questions? Um, just for oh yeah, Jay, go ahead. Oh, just a quick question, and I'm really <clears throat> appreciative of the conversation and the presentation and certainly have a much better understanding of what's going on and echo what other folks are, are saying. Um, it, it feels to me like because we haven't had the success with grant funding, grant funding now in this process that, you know, that we have some exposure and we, we, you know, we need to spend the money and move forward. I don't think there's a lot of controversy around or yeah, discussion necessarily around whether or not we this is a necessity for the city. But I'm wondering if taking a long view, if this is not something um, we need to be sort of create a line item in our budget that's putting away even a little bit of money at a time over the year. I mean, it's a technology. It works on it works on cycles. Motorola says it's 10 to 15 years. You know, it'll probably be closer to 10. Um, thankfully, it's not an iPhone or Android cycle where it's every year or 18 months. But if we, you know, even if we put, create a line item and put $5,000 a year when we're thinking about as technology evolves and, and this type of service evolves and changes, we're in a position where we're not having to, we're, we're not in a corner um, and needing this significant outlay, we're in a place where at least we would have some options. So I don't know, uh, Chief Pete, if you have thought on that or, or others, but just I'm just trying to take the long view on how um, this process could best, you know, to make sure we're just not in a position where we, we just have to, you know, where the, the decision's kind of been made for us. Thank yes, you. sir. And, and yeah, that, that is something that we've, we've definitely done and sitting down with Fred, uh, Captain Nornson and the rest of the sergeants, uh, in the department, we've come up with a, a strategic list, a project list, if you will, and what we see within the immediate future and then long-term goals, things as even like radios uh, or handheld radios, uh, cars, how, how do we, what's the normal life cycle of these things and when, do, when can we anticipate uh, 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 looking at having to replace them or turn them over? So that, that's something that's definitely part of our strategic planning goal and we do have a list that we're working to finalize uh, to, to meet that potential demand. We don't want to come back and say, hey, here's something we didn't plan for. And all of a sudden we have to demolish the budget for, you know, outside of the priorities of what the uh, city council is, is looking at because we didn't plan correctly looking into the future. Thank you. Um, Jack. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, because this is a radio based system, going to this does not uh, fix the problem with the interference with the cab dispatch system up in Montreal, right? So that's a, that's an interesting question. No, so, so that's completely separate from the console. The, the interference that we get from the Canadians is based on a frequency, um, which Capital Fire is getting relicensed for a different frequency to make that go away. That's completely separate from the consoles themselves. But but a solution is in the works, you're saying. So that's good. it is. It is. Great. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Okay. Um, so at this point, I don't think that we are needing to take any action, but if there are any members of the public who would like to ask a question or um, speak now would be the time. Um, yeah, Madam, Madam Mayor, Steve Whitaker here. Go ahead. So I'm glad that the chief uh, and Fred brought up, uh, or Mr. Cummings uh, brought up the continuity of operations, um, but 
spending a few hundred thousand dollars on the latest console does not a continuity of operations plan make. I have uh, a year ago or so made a public records request for the continuity of operations plan, and uh, it's pretty much just a couple of cell numbers for folks and a couple of locations. There's no plan at all. So uh, the that's a bigger issue that it requ will require funding and planning and assignment of tasks, but it, it, it does point to the issue of radio continuity it is an important part, but the parts, the radio modules, it's, it's pretty easy Google research to find out what parts have failed on the MCC 5500s. And there's a, a healthy market for them, ranging from a few hundred dollars for the modules to a full system exactly replicating what we have in Montpelier for 27,000. I have just forwarded to Dan and Donna a memo from another public safety authority that uh, heard of the discontinuance of the pro product. Motorola rep showed up at the council meeting and recommended the few parts they buy and they could get several more years, five more years life out of them. So for about a $13,000 investment. So when we're talking about spending 300,000, and, and I don't dispute that there's new bells and whistles and features and interoperability and all those good things, but most of that's gonna show its benefit when and if we are in a failover mode, interoperability mode with Barry. Barry is nowhere close to buying this uh, sister set of consoles. So I think there's more planning to do, I think it's, I don't think you were being asked to make a decision to release the funding to authorize entering this four hundred three four hundred thousand dollar commitment tonight. Um, but I believe that there is significant more planning and documentation. We could easily get several more years life out of these consoles with available spare parts. Um, I've been in the computer trades for a long time, and these are standard compact towers with regular power supplies you can pick up on the Barry Montpelier Road. And it is true that the Motorola specialized boards uh, cannot be easily found, and that's why the Motorola rep recommended having spares. At this point, we could probably still get spares from Motorola at a price at a higher price point. But my point is that you're being asked by folks that have uh, yet to do the documentation. I did a public records request for documentation of the failures. I came back, they came back with nothing. I don't, we don't have any documentation of the failures of these, you know? It, so I think we're, we're a little bit cart before the horse. Um, it is an informative presentation. It's good to know for all of us to know what we're relying on. Uh, and there are reliability questions, but there are much less expensive until we know how much federal money we're getting and what priority to put it in, um, I would say that you don't release the money for the new consoles, and especially until the Televate report comes in. And Motorola, has, there's only one dealer and support tech engineer firm in, my, in Vermont uh, because of the way Motorola uh, runs its very monopolistic practices. And most folks will agree with you, they make great stuff, but they're pretty brutal in their protecting territories and not letting people compete. And that's not good for business, that's not good for pricing, that's not good for, uh, you know, a free market. So I'm not suggesting we're going to switch from Moro, but I'm suggesting there's a lot more due diligence to do here from a policy point of view and a lot more planning on continuity of operations it should perceive this. I'll forward an article that describes what a continuity of operations plan looks like, um, or address a lot of the points that Montpelier has yet to address. Thank you. Um, on one other item, the agenda tonight did not include call in for information. So if you're planning to take binding legal action, you may have a problem with uh, having warned the meeting and allowed people opportunity to get in. I only got in because Dan was courteous enough to call me back and read me the information. So 
that's a gross mission to be conducting a virtual meeting with no, it, it says it's happening in city council, in city council chambers. It, none of the meeting information is on the agenda. Okay. So that's a heads up. Yep. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and yep. uh, um, Cameron, go ahead. Hi, um, I just want to clarify that point. Um, the agenda is on the website, does have the call-in information. And so if anyone missed it, if anyone is watching at home, you can call in at 929-205-6099. And the meeting ID is 957-8831-7586. And that is on the agenda on the website. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam, being, right. Madam Chair, being contradicted just now, I would ask that as of, I downloaded the agenda packet uh, not 20 minutes or a half hour ago, and it does not include the information. And okay. so unless that just got changed in that CYA mode, uh, I would ask you to look into that. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, anyone else I wanna offer a comment on uh, or a question on uh, the consoles? Okay, so I'm not seeing anybody. Um, all right, so well, thank you again, um, both uh, Fred and uh, Chief Pete. This was very helpful, and um, and we look forward to just hearing the update when it's time. All right, thank you. All right, thank so you. yeah, so we're gonna uh, move on then um, to uh, the. Uh, Zoning public uh, zoning amendment public hearing. So I'm going to officially open the um, public hearing uh, on this, and uh, just so that folks know what to expect, uh, I'm going to let excuse me, Mike Miller, our planning director, uh, sort of explain this. Um, then we'll have the time for questions from uh, council. Then we'll I'd love to uh, hear from from the public, and then we might go back to uh, to the council for uh, for thoughts. So go ahead, uh, Mike, uh, take away. Yes, good evening, Mayor and Council and everybody. Um, so a uh, couple options for uh, kind of kicking things off. Uh, I don't know if you guys would like me to uh, quickly go through the presentation I gave uh, two weeks ago, or if you uh, just want a quick summary of what was presented, um, kind of leave it a, a little bit open as to uh, what you'd like to do, because we do, we do have the presentation. I did send out a memo to answer um, uh, Dan's question on the Airbnb. It was a longer one. We can go into that and have some conversation about that. Um, but I, I didn't know how much time you wanted me to spend giving re-going re over the presentation again. Um, uh, go ahead, Jack. I think it would be useful to go over it. There are people in, at home looking in. There are members of the public who are here specifically for this presentation. And so I think it would be uh, helpful to do that. Thanks. OK. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So I will just need to have Cameron give me some share screen options. it would be good to go. OK. All right. So um, this is going to be a pretty quick uh, summary, and then we can go through and answer questions of what some of the details are of, of all of the, the changes. There aren't a lot of changes in the document. On the web, you'll find an abbreviated change, which really is the red line version that goes through and shows what specifically all the changes are, but I removed all the pages that don't have any changes. So it's a, it's a quicker way of kind of getting to all the changes, um, but they're organized as the document. The zoning bylaws are actually organized, but there are three primary groups of changes and I'll go through each one of these. There's a set of changes that started because of the Sabins Pasture Development Project. We had a second set of housing related changes because of some state laws 
uh, that were changed last year. And there's also uh, a number of internal inconsistencies that um, Meredith Crandall, our zoning administrator, and I have found um, over the past two years. And so we wanted to go through and make some changes. If we were already addressing housing, we wanted to clean those up. And then we have some other um, miscellaneous changes, which are mostly minor and technical. And I'll go through each of those really quick. So the Sabins related changes, uh, two of them are actually um, the first and the third are, are they both deal with traffic. Um, and so what we did was we made some changes to 3303, which is in conditional use. Um, and then all we did in 3504 was made that match what's in 3303. So we simply have a reference that says um, to use these rules because they were slightly different and we didn't mean to have them different. Um, so what we changed in traffic was to remove level of service as a requirement. Um, and, you know, we organized and cleaned up the requirement. Um, and I wanted to point out because it's, it's a couple of people have um, contacted me and, and made notes that they were concerned that we would no longer be doing traffic impact studies. The traffic impact study is still required. Um, if you're looking at the abbreviated zoning uh, strikeout version, it's on the next page and that's why you don't see it. Um, but it is the, the requirement for a traffic impact study does still exist. That was not changed. Um, what was changed was the requirement um, that goes through and, and uh, looks at level of service for intersections and says that you can't make an intersection worse than say a, a level C or a level D intersection. And when you have an intersection like Barry and Maine, which is at a level F, um, even if they, uh, even if the project put money into a project to bring it from an F to a D, it's still less than the C. So we still end up in, in a situation where um, a project could actually make the intersection better and still not get approval because it, it doesn't bring it up to a high enough level. Um, even though they're not responsible for most of the, the traffic problems. So that was a little, bit of, a little bit of summary. So we removed the level of service as a requirement, but most of the other pieces are still there. Uh, the other piece was a really um, just, we insert, we removed the exemption um, in the applicability, or excuse me, we added an exemption into the applicability for the Riverfront District. Um, and so the new neighborhood development was required for any project in the Riverfront District um, over a certain size, um, which Sabin's Pasture is the only parcel that that qualified for. Um, and so the the rules were very confusing, or not not very confusing. They were they were very they were designed to help in a slightly different arrangement. The Planning Commission in 2017 had made a proposal for how to manage um, the Sabins pasture area. Um, council chose a different path and then we had a few inconsistencies and one was the new neighborhood PUD. Um, and what happened for this proposal is that they don't need any of the benefits of a PUD. So usually the trade-off is uh, we'll give you more density if you meet a higher standard. Well, they don't need any of the new additional density. So they're getting none of the benefits, but have to meet all of the requirements. And those additional requirements aren't really making the project necessarily better. And um, so the Planning Commission reviewed the request and uh, narrowly made the decision um, because there was a number of options they had. The Planning Commission chose to kind of the, the narrowest option, which was just to go and say, well, um, Riverfront District does not, projects in Riverfront District don't need to meet the new neighborhood PUD. So that's the change. Um, the housing related ones, um, these have, we have less comment on or less options on because they were state law changes. These are the required ones. So um, how we manage non-conforming parcels, which are parcels that are too small for the zoning district requirements. Um, there's requirements in figure 215, which is the use table. Um, so what this 
change under state law said was one unit to four unit buildings can no longer be denied for character of the area. Therefore, these uses were changed from conditional uses to permitted uses. And the primary reason for that is there was no way we could legally deny any of these projects if they were conditional use. Um, there are only three requirements. There's traffic, there's character of the area, and there's um, community facilities. And therefore it becomes, um, we, we don't have any issues with the facilities. Um, a, a, a duplex is not gonna cause a traffic issue. So therefore um, we really, there's no way we could deny a project. So therefore we shifted all of those from conditional to permitted. And then there were some minor changes to accessory dwelling units um, that were now required. Um, so some of the changes that were not required under state law, but we wanted to clean up. We Again, we had some gaps and inconsistencies between these, such as rooming and boarding houses were discussed in the specific uses, um, but were not in the use table. So you know, we just needed to get these things cleaned up. Um, so we reclassified everything into three groups. We have dwelling units, we have uh, congregate living, and then we have specific uses for group and residential homes. So your dwelling units are most of the housing in the city. Um, these are residential units that contain, independently contain all of the requirements for a dwelling unit. So they've got a bathroom, they've got a kitchen, they've got living areas, they've got uh, bedrooms. So there's a certain list of things that every dwelling unit must have. Congregate living shares one or more of those dwelling units. Um, one or more of those requirements of a dwelling unit. So for example, you may live in a dormitory, but uh, eat at a, um, at a cafeteria and um, in the dormitory, you share bathrooms and other facilities. So that would be a congregate living arrangement. Um, and there's, there are certain other ones that come up, certain group, group living arrangements, um, uh, certain nursing home facility type um, uses, um, co-housing, um, is, there's none of these in, in uh, Montpelier as far as I know, but they're co-housing options. So again, it's, it's a matter that you have exclusive rights to a piece of it, but you share other pieces, uh, sharing a bathroom, sharing um, a kitchen. And then the, these are the state licensed ones. So we kind of gave them their own special category. Group homes and residential care homes are licensed by the state and therefore kind of have their own um, set of requirements. And these, because we regroup things, this just led to a number of changes in other places where this appears throughout the document. So we had to rename uses, we had to adjust uh, where how the jet density is discussed in these sections here, 02 and 3111. Um, we had to rename how housing is discussed in the parking table. So these kind of all make sense. You'd kind of expect that if you're gonna change the names, then you kind of got to find out where the names are and fix them. And then the last of the housing related ones were just to go through and make some changes to the definitions. One was to remove a minimum 250 square foot requirement. So dwelling units used to have all the list of requirements. And then at the end, and it said, it, and has to be at least 250 square feet in size. Uh, this started to lead to some problems for people who had been talking about doing tiny homes or other living arrangements that may be smaller. And it was felt that um, we could probably remove that 250 square foot requirement. Um, if, if, if you can, you can, the ring pieces is very small, that then now um, your health code, your building from, from the point we're not, not going to deny. And the fusions and the changes to the trainers on the buffer map, carrying buff on the net map, we sign review bounty for districts and neighborhoods um, that incorrectly mapped in September 2020. We made some changes, if you'll remember back on Terrace. Um, we wanted to match up all the lines to the National Register Historic District boundaries. So we were supposed to remove two properties out of 
um, one district and move them to another. And we all talked about, we're moving to two parcels, we're only moving two parcels, but actually the map that was made and warned moved five parcels. So we're simply fixing and rewarning with the correct map um, just to, to, to make sure we technically dot the I and cross the T to say, no, 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 even though the wrong map got in the warning, this is the correct map. Um, there's some other changes um, about the applicability. So this is the, this is the global applicability. Who needs to apply for a permit? And what we had was a gap where people could actually go out and remove the vegetation in a wetland or in a riparian buffer because it isn't actually in the requirement um, for needing a permit. So we just add, added that in. It's, it's a little bit of a subtle thing. Um, I always try to tell people it's, it's like buckets or it's an if then statement. You can't go through and say, well, because it's a then, then we've got to go back. We just go through and say, no, no, no. Um, we'll put it in the front and say, if you're going to remove vegetation from a wetland or a riparian buffer, then you need to apply for a zoning permit, which then gives us the ability to deny it. Um, in 1301, um, we added some rules regarding reasonable accommodations for ADA. So currently, we don't have a process. People would have to go and appeal and apply and go to the DRB, and it was a, a, it seemed like a much longer process. And we should try to make reasonable accommodations something that we can do um, administratively. So that's what this is doing and providing us a, a better avenue to be able to manage these. Um, 310 fix a technical error for um, some uh, the. I think on one side of the column, it says greater than or equal to, and then on the other side, it says only greater than. So we just had to match a couple of items up. Again, technical little things. Um, we were striking this part of the sign regulations because it specifically says we're gonna regulate content, which is unconstitutional. Um, point th uh, this is about fences on class one highways um, and this was just changed titles. 3205 was outdoor seating, was uh, meant to apply just to patrons. Um, it was kind of being forced to be applied overly broadly. So if you wanted to put out just a bench for people to enjoy and sit down, um, any member of the public, um, that you'd have to go through a full DRB, potentially a, a DRB hearing for something. This is just trying to apply it just to the patrons. If you're, do if you're doing outdoor seating, in order to provide service to patrons, then, then you need to go through these rules. Um, so yeah, the last ones are, are relative, again, pretty minor, relatively minor changes. Uh, again, the definitions, we had to make some quick, uh, some small changes. Again, these are really technical and to, unless you get into their um, technically accessory structures are supposed to be detached but we had attached ones like porches and decks that were considered accessories so we just had to go and make some changes to the definition and we did at the last meeting vote to make the change on uh, adjusting three to two parcels for a driveway so a driveway can only be for two parcels um, if it's three then it goes to a private private street so that way it's consistent with e911 rules which we will get to next month so that's the quick summary of what the, this, this most recent set of changes are. Um, and I, I don't know if you want me just to quickly summarize the memo that I included, which I can really about say the, was- About Air, Airbnbs? About the Airbnbs. Um, sure. Yeah, that'd be yeah, a quick summary of that I think would be good. Okay. So the question that uh, Councillor Richardson had was really was about um, if somebody was doing an Airbnb and they were renting out a room, would that get, what would that do to that, that residential unit? Would it then make it a, um, a mixed unit? Because, you know, you're now you know, now, now, now you do, you're going to go from a dwelling unit to a congregate living. 
because now you're sharing some of the facilities um, or is it still a residential use? And it was an interesting question. And we took a lot of time, Meredith and I, to kind of peel that onion back. And the memo is quite long and kind of gets into some of the details of how we tried to peel that onion. But ultimately, we kind of came down to the conclusion that really anything that's Airbnb is really more about lodging than it is about residential uses. And our opinion is we really believe that things have changed substantially over the past five years. The, the, the playing field has changed. It used to be lodging was lodging and housing was housing. And that's not the way things are anymore. Um, they've really, people will rent um, houses to go on vacation to. And um, at the same time, we have hotels and motels where people live in. Um, and so we really kind of have much more of a blending. And I think we need to um, take a longer and more careful look at, rather than looking at them as two separate groups, we should really look at them as a single group. And that was our recommendation was to let, let's start thinking about lodging as, a, as almost a form of temporary housing, as opposed to thinking of lodging as a commercial use, we'll look at it as temporary or transient housing. And at a certain point we cross a line. So you can use permanent housing for transient housing because it has all of the requirements, but you can't use transient housing for permanent housing because it doesn't have all of the required facilities. Um, so our recommendation was that we don't need to make any changes, I think at this point to the draft, but that we would, with, with input, we'd love to have some of your thoughts if you thought we were going in the right direction with this, we could go back and work on a, on a revision that maybe would you'd be able to see this fall. Okay, well, that, that's certainly helpful. Um, so just a heads up that I do wanna uh, hear from the public. So um, for at this point, I think if council has just like clarifying questions um, that let's let's just start there. Um, what clarifications um, would be useful, and then I'm gonna then I'm gonna go to the public. Okay, uh, Dan, go ahead. Sure, just one clarification on that memo, and, and let me say, Mike, I, I really appreciate your and Meredith's um, drafting and research that went into that, um, and I'll have a lot more thoughts, but for just limited clarification, um, my question was really about whether this um, sort of shared dwelling unit language would accidentally trigger in Airbnbs. So I just want to be clear that your opinion is that it, it doesn't as it's currently drafted. Is that right? Correct. I would say, and especially in the case of a single family home, I would say it doesn't. Um, right. I mean, the difference between the tour case and say like what we're imagining is the tour case, they're renting out their home. They leave and another family comes in and rents it. As opposed to if I stay in the house, but I let somebody use a spare bedroom who's not a family member, who's paying me and is essentially staying there on a, a short-term basis and sharing my facilities or even a medium-term basis. Um, you know, I think that was just the question was to make sure that this language didn't didn't accidentally get us into the Airbnb regulatory game when it wasn't necessarily intended to. Yeah, and I, I don't think it, it does because we've tried in 3111, um, we tried to go through and say, we don't regulate occupancy. And that was one of the things. So whether somebody is there as a roommate or somebody is there on a short-term basis, you know, I think our determination would be that we don't regulate occupancy. And I think the Supreme Court was kind of looking at it and examining things that way to go through and say, well, you know, if you can have guests um, stay, uh, if you can have roommates and you can have, you know, um, guests come over and visit for, for Thanksgiving, you don't, you don't have to go through and um, go in and get a zoning permit change because you're going to have your family sleep on your couch. Um, it's, it kind of all follows that same logic if, you know, if we, it is a commercial venture to go and have somebody pay, but at the same time, if I were getting a roommate, my roommate, I might have my roommate pay half the rent. Um, so I think there's, it's, it's there. 
yeah, I, I think we're we're fine with because of 3111, the conversation that says we don't regulate occupancies. I think we have a, a good out on that, but I think we could do a better job of integrating those going forward. Thanks. Okay, uh, Connor, go ahead. Yeah, just just clarification, Mike. Um, what's the difference between a group home and a residential um, facility there? I noticed we added residential, but I, I don't see definitions for. All right, so uh, group homes and residential care homes are state licensed facilities. They have very specific definitions. Um, and then on top of that, um, so your, so, so really quick, your group homes are what you would expect a group home to be. Um, uh, they operating in a single family home, um, under state law, if there are eight or less people, then it is by right a use of a single family dwelling. So it, it doesn't even need a zoning permit. Um, if, if you have a state license to own, um, uh, say, um, I'm trying to off the top of my head, come up with some of the ones I've had in the past, um, a dementia home, where you have six folks that are living there and it's all, uh, you know, it would be a single family use and I, there would not even be a permit required. As long as it's eight or less and as long as it meets the licensing requirements, it's automatically uh, a single family use. If there's nine or more, we, that's why you have the group home major because that's one, if you have a group home that doesn't meet the definition, uh, it's still, still licensed, but it's just larger than the, that, that exemption, in which case we can require per either permitted or conditional or not allowed at all. We can decide where those are allowed. Um, your residential care homes are your nursing facilities um, and, and some of the similar ones to that. Again, it's a state licensed facility. Um, uh, heat and woods, um, those types of facilities. Great, thanks Mike. Um, other clarifying questions. Okay. Um, all right. I would love to um, open it up to the public. And um, yeah, if you have something you would like to say, question, comment, concern, uh, if you could uh, raise your hand or um, or unmute yourself or um, just even physically wave uh, with your camera on, that would be helpful. And okay, great, thank you. Uh, and we will um, uh, get an order here. So Phyllis, I saw uh, you first there. You can also use the raise hand function um, in Zoom, uh, but I don't see anybody else yet. Um, so Phyllis, go ahead. Uh, Ms. Mayor, Council Members, thank you for letting me speak tonight. I am Phyllis Rubenstein. I reside in the College Hill area. I'm also a member of the Montpelier Conservation Commission, although I'm not speaking tonight on behalf of the Conservation Commission. Um, the Commission was not aware of the zoning issues that were uh, being brought to the City Council until we read the article in the newspaper in the Times Argus a couple of weeks ago after your last meeting. And Mike was at our last uh, commission, um, conservation commission meeting and did uh, talk to us a bit about some of the zoning issues. A, I think a non-controversial issue that I just want to bring up is that in terms of the natural resources inventory map where there are some minor fixes being made. I just wanted to report that the Conservation Commission does have a, a subcommittee that's working on revising our natural resources inventory map. That map was developed prior to the existence of some of the advanced technology with LIDAR. And now with LIDAR, uh, there are all sorts of layers that can be added to the map. I did have a uh, an email contact with Mike about it and he said that the map could be updated whenever we do um, complete that. But the issues that I actually want to talk about, and as I said, this is as a resident, not as a member of the commission, 
have to do with the changes to zoning. And honestly, I don't know a lot about zoning. Um, and, um, but uh, what I do know is that um, Mike talked about the removal of some requirements for traffic and conditional use. And he talked about that uh, Main and Berry Street is a class F street and there's nothing that could be done on Berry Street that would make it worse. And, um, but there, um, 3504 and 3304 not only refer to um, intersections that have signals, but they also refer to unsignaled intersections. And in both of those sections, the document that I'm looking at has uh, some significant uh, requirements deleted. And I think that we have to uh, as a keep, we have to consider uh, why these requirements were put in there in the first place and that these were well thought out requirements. And I do not see that there's still, that there remains a requirement for a traffic impact study. As a matter of fact, in 3504, the provisions about traffic impact study have been deleted. Unless someone wants to tell me that the uh, cross out lines don't mean deleted, but 3504.B, traffic impact study, that's all deleted. Um, so my concern is that we have a street that's already very uh, heavily used and that there needs to be uh, these zoning requirements to make sure that any development does not further impact on the uh, congestion on Berry Street. And um, so the other signaled streets are, well, I think there's only one other signaled street, which is then comes out at um, Route 2 uh, on the uh, Pioneer Bridge. But we have a number of unsignaled intersections, whether it's Charles Street, Sibley Avenue, um, uh, Monsignor Crosby, there, there are a number of unsignaled streets, intersections. And um, I think that this requires further scrutiny to see what, what, what would this, the deletion of this, of these requirements, what would the impact be on, uh, on any possible development? The other issue that I want to just briefly address is the um, the the change of removing, deleting the um, riverfront from um, uh, the riverfront district and from the, the na new neighborhood plan unit development in section 3404B. I, I actually don't even understand the ramifications of the deletion. Um, and, and so I would like some further clarification on that because I simply don't, as I said, I don't understand the ramifications. Um, so, and I think that if a zoning requirement was put into place after probably years of discussion and scrutiny, that it shouldn't simply be changed because there's one development in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have lost, oh, Mike, would, um, would you like to address the the clarification point there about um, uh, impacts of removing the PUD requirement from the Riverfront District? Uh, well, there was actually a couple of points that 
Phyllis made. So um, if you want, let me just share my screen real quick. Uh, where is it? Okay. So uh, this is um, this is what the final three three o three traffic would look like. So this is again we're talking about conditional use. Um, this is what the requirement would be after the strikeout. And again, if you have the strikeout version, what happens is this is where there's a page break. So you don't have the benefit of seeing these two. And that was what I was trying to point out was that these two have not been removed. Um, so um, a traffic impact study is still required. Um, we can still require mitigation. Um, and any project that happens, well, if, if a project in Sabin's pasture happens and it generates more than 75 trips, which, you know, the preliminary discussions that had come up would require the traffic study. So um, there will be a traffic study and the standards would now be that the applicant is required to prove that their development will not have an undue adverse effect upon the traffic in the area, including that volume type timing traffic generated by the proposed development shall not be substantially greater than what would normally occur at the uh, at nearby uses or at other uses permitted in the area and that reasonable measures have been taken to minimize or mitigate the amount of vehicular traffic generated by the proposed development. So the DRB has a standard. Um, it, it is, um, it, it has the flexibility um, for the board to make a, a determination. They could certainly find that some proposal will have an undue adverse effect, uh, very, uh, very legal term that, that matches what Act 250, the words they use. So there's a lot of um, legal, you know, what, what does that mean? What does undue adverse effect mean? And there's a Quichi decision and it's a very, you know, we have a legal process that we could go through to understand that. And we can require the traffic impact studies. These are all um, still going to be here. Um, and then if I can scroll, I don't know if I'll be able to scroll fairly quickly down to three, five. I believe three, five, oh, four traffic. So yes, the entire section of traffic was removed. But what was inserted was that the traffic provision for subdivisions shall be the same as those that apply to conditional use applications in section 3303, except that the word subdivision shall be sub substituted for development where applicable. So um, yes, all those were deleted. The reason why we, we are doing it this way is because when we're talking about traffic, whether we're talking about it for subdivisions or whether we're talking about it for conditional use, we're trying to talk about the same thing. And unfortunately, what happened um, in the last version that was, well, the version that was adopted in 2018 was the wording in this section was slightly different than the wording in the 3303. We made, or we made some corrections in 3303 to say this is a better way of doing it, but we forgot to make those changes in 3504. So rather than restating 3303 here, we just reference it, we reference it instead. It's a better better way of doing it. So as we make changes to traffic in 3303, it'll automatically change the, the, the requirements here. Um, so that, that was the, the two changes. The last one then was um, about the, the PUD. Um, oh, and getting to the, the point of these were talked about um, and, and considered and put in for a reason. Um, and they were, these were, a lot of these rules, we had uh, hired a consultant that helped us put together the, the zoning that was adopted in 2018. And um, it did talk about a number of things, including level of service. And at the time, level of service was considered kind of the engineering standard that everybody follows. Um, since that time, especially as it pertains to housing, a number of places, including the entire state of California, has started to reevaluate whether or not level of service is appropriate. And the reason why is because it, it's, 
as you make hard rules for level of service, you end up um, not having the flexibility to talk about, um, you know, uh, say the example I think I used last time was, let's say the intersection at Barry and Main has, a, a, I'll make up a number, a two minute and 30 second delay at the peak. And if we develop Saban's pasture, it'll be two minutes and 35 seconds. So it'll have a five second more of a delay. Is that worth denying, um, say, 50 or 100 housing units? Um, you know, we have a goal of getting more housing units, and, and maybe we should be able to balance that and make a determination that says, no, you know what? I don't think that's undue. Um, it's only five seconds. It's already 230. But unfortunately, the way it was worded, if it was below a level C or below a level D, depending on the intersection, it was it was going to be um, have to be denied or there, it seemed like that's what the language was saying. And, and a number of states, um, including, as I said, California, are starting to remove those because density is a good thing. And using traffic as a reason to deny density uh, is, is something that California is trying to say, no, we actually want the density. And if it happens to hurt the traffic a little bit, then that's going to be the cost. Um, again, that's a policy decision, obviously, for the council to consider. But the Planning Commission voted and was very supportive of eliminating the level of service as, as a threshold and instead leaving it to the Development Review Board to review it as to whether or not it's an undue adverse effect. And um, so then the last change, what happened with, um, again, same thing, that same conversation goes for the new neighborhood development PUD. Um, they provided the, the, the developers, again, they still have no project. They simply have been trying to consider whether or not they want to invest the time in the engineering and the design of a project. And they look at the zoning rules and say, we can't do a reasonable project in their mind um, with the rules the way they were written. Um, because of a number of the requirements that were in there. They felt it would make a less than ideal project. Um, and the Planning Commission reviewed a number of options that they presented. And we reviewed a number of other options that the Planning Commission themselves came up with. Um, and, and the feeling was that the, the best solution was to not require PUDs. They could do a PUD, um, but not require it. And again, you know, how did this conversation get here? Um, again, the Planning Commission had gone through and had zoned all of Sabin's Pasture, all 100 acres of Sabin's Pasture into one zoning district, Residential 6000. And the zoning was then worked to make that work. And what they wanted to do was to provide incentives and in some cases, requirements for people to come in and um, put in an application and therefore cluster into the lower 15 acres. And um, in order to make them, in order to make this trade off happen, they put uh, these requirements in there to, to, to require that that clustering happen. Um, but now what we have is uh, what ended up happening was the city council went through and adopted uh, two separate districts. They said, no, nope, we don't want to incentivize people to cluster. We want the development in the bottom and we want less development at the top. And so we're going to change the zoning and put high density in the 15 acres and low density at the top. Um, but this requirement remained. So for one, for just for one example, um, it requires 40% of the land to be conserved. Um, so you're already in the 15 acres and you're in, you're in that lower area. So it, it, it's not talking about the upper 85 acres. It's only talking about the lower area. And you're, you're in this weird requirement. Um, there are other requirements that would then go through and require you to orient to the street. So a street that's running north-south while Barry's running east-west, you have to orient all the buildings east-west. Um, while the developers said, well, you know, we'd like the option to be able to orient buildings towards, you know, the, the, the south. Um, that would make for, for nicer design, um, but they wouldn't be allowed to do that because the PUD requires them to orient towards the street. 
um, access to parking. Um, they want to put underground parking under their buildings, but they can't put underground parking under their buildings because of the way the the, the parking requirements are are in the PUD. So we had an option to change all of the rules of the new neighborhood PUD, but new neighborhood PUD could be used anywhere in the city. And therefore the thought was, we liked the rules in the new neighborhood PUD. Let's leave those rules. Let's just exempt this one parcel. So I hope that answers all the questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's helpful. Um, other thoughts, questions, comments? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Um, can you hear yes, me? but I am not sure who's... I'm speaking. Deborah Messing. Oh, yes. Go. Oh, okay. I, I see now. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Oh, also, I also wouldn't um, mind also telling us where you live. Sorry, I forgot to mention that earlier. Sure. Um, I live on Charles Street, which is um, in the neighborhood of Saban's Pasture, and uh, my comment is relating to Saban's Pasture. Um, but before I get to that, um, as everyone was talking about traffic and congestion, I, I, I just feel that it's important to remember that our goal here is to reduce um, the use of automobiles. And so um, hopefully, um, hopefully the use of shuttles and, and, um, uh, and parking along the edge of the town and, and walking. I walk from Charles Street all the time to the center of town and down to the, uh, down to the new bike path. And so I just feel that uh, one of the beauties of developing in Saban's Pasture is that it is a walkable it is walkable to, you know, the rest of the town. Okay, so um, my comment though um, is that um, recently I stumbled across an ad uh, online for SD Ireland South Village Development in South Burlington, and um, I learned from doing a little research into this that this is considered an agro hood. And it turns out there are thousands of agrihoods, uh, it's a weird name, um, in, in the country. And what, it, what they are are developments that are centered uh, around an agricultural feature or a hub. And in the case of the South Village development in South Burlington, this is centered around a 13 acre organic farm. They've partnered with this nonprofit, uh, not for profit organization called Common Roots, which uh, supports local agriculture. And this nonprofit basically operates this working farm with a full time manager, a farm stand, greenhouses, chickens, beehives. Um, residents can volunteer to work on this farm. Um, the, there's some financing involved in this that is something 0.05% of the sale price of the housing unit goes towards this. Um, so yeah, so residents can volunteer to work in the farm. And, and in this development, there's also more than 130 acres of meadow, woods, ponds, and more held in conservation in perpetuity. Um, so I started to imagine that this model could be adapted to Saban's pasture. I already had, before this, as I walked back and forth um, in front of it, I started to imagine it as a kind of, instead of having just, um, you know, the generic landscaping and a few raised beds, I started thinking of the possibility of having a real garden of Eden there with orchards and all kinds of growing things. And, but this was something different. Um, to have an actual working organic farm started to seem like a great possibility. Um, this development in South Burlington has these very large, expensive, maybe, I don't know if you would call them McMansions, but um, relatively speaking, they are, they're all, uh, they all have three bathrooms. <laughs> That's what 
really puzzled me. Okay, and they were all either side of $500,000. Okay, so um, I just decided, first of all, to call um, SD Ireland, just call him on the phone. And I ended up talking to Patrick Ireland, who um, was very interested in the idea of maybe uh, um, using this model in Sabin's pasture. And I gave him a big um, summary of all the benefits of Montpelier and how it, housing pressure and all these things. Also, so one of the beauties of it is that it would um, return the property to its former use as a working farm. It was uh, until 1972, it was a working farm. It's oriented towards the South. Um, but um, I think it would be uniquely suited because, um, to this model because Montpelier, people in Montpelier have a great interest in local foods. So the pasture is very close to the co-op and the bike path and the train. And, and I think actually the setup is, is superior to that of South Village because those people have to use their car to get to a town center. Anyhow, all I wanna say as far as zoning is that I would ask the zoning commission uh, to that the zoning ordinance be structured so as to allow this kind of development. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. I feel like you just invented a new kind of, uh, like a planned unit development, only it's uh, agri-hood. It's pretty cool. Um, uh, Mike, anything you want to say about that? I mean, it's uh, is, is such a thing like that possible under current zoning? Yeah, I would say, I mean, everything always depends on the details of, of what gets proposed. But yeah, there's nothing in the zoning that would prohibit um, a, a developer who has that interest in, in going in that direction. Um, and I, I would just want also want everyone to remember that we're, we're looking at things. We're just looking at the zoning at this point. Um, if and when an application comes up, um, we don't have an application. This isn't um, this is this is this is a precursor to a to, to um, them looking into putting together an application. So um, there's nothing that says that this would um, impact that, uh, you know, or, or approve the, any, any approval to change the zoning isn't gonna be approving a project. Um, it is simply amending the zoning to allow a project to move to its next step. Okay, others. Uh, Mayor Watson, I've got a brief comment on this topic. Go ahead. Uh, I just want to, because it's uh, it's coming up in the legislative process as well, the difficulty of navigating uh, the compressed audio, the limited audibility, I could, Mike was fading in and out while I was trying to hear him. Uh, these are these are major issues that are going to affect the city's development environment and attractiveness, et cetera, for you know years to come. And I would caution that whatever we do, we anticipate uh, an opportunity to revisit it uh, when things get back to uh, a more participatory uh, mode, because this this is not. Zoom meetings are not for everybody, and we're leaving out anyone who can't tolerate them uh, in these major changes to uh, the city's future. Um, and I just wanted to get that point on the record and then ask for a minute of, oh, I, I stand corrected on the agenda. The, the system, the wonderful system that I've been complaining to the dog out of about, downloaded when I hit download tonight's agenda, it brought up last year's agenda from a couple days different. So that's the agenda that didn't have the call in details. But that's what I got at 629 when I was in a hurry to dial in. So uh, I stay corrected on that, but you, I've been raising the problem with your website software. I would ask for an opportunity for public comment because um, I missed your general appearances, not through no fault of my own, you know. I'll await your uh, your decision on that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, others. Um, 
Okay, I'm not, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not seeing any further um, hands. Oh, before, uh, before you go, Phyllis, um, I see you there, though. <laughs> um, is there anyone who hasn't spoken yet who would, who would like to address the council? You can either unmute yourself or turn your video on and wave or use the raise hand function in Zoom. Um, any of those are options. Okay, I'm not um, seeing anyone else. Uh, Phyllis, go ahead. So I just wanted to respond to one thing that Mike said. Mike said that uh, one of the requirements of the uh, neighborhood development plan would have made it impossible to build houses facing the south. And, and he referred to having a road that goes north-south. And so that uh, presupposes that there's a road going north off of Berry Street, because obviously if the development, if the buildings were all facing Berry Street, then you'd get the southern exposure. So I just wanted to point that out, that, um, uh, that, that I think that there is a lot that does need to be considered here. And um, thank you. And I would also add that I could not hear Mike during part of his presentation, but I think I, I caught the gist of it because of the uh, uh, internet connection issues. And, and I'll also just add, uh, since the last speaker talked about everybody, not everybody is comfortable on Zoom, although I've used the raise hand function on other Zoom uh, sessions, I don't see that available on my computer for this session. So it could just be me. That is very interesting. Um, I, other I will say that, um, I, sorry, Mayor, I just wanted to give an introduction on that. So Zoom did update. It's the worst. I'm sorry, y'all. To raise your hand at the bottom of your screen, there's a little button that says reactions. It used to just have emojis. Now it has where the raise hand function is. So um, I'm sorry about that. They change this often. And again, if you're calling in, um, free, feel free to unmute yourself. But um, I think it's star six. Thank you for that. I also had not um, seen that the raise hand function had gone under reactions. That's helpful. <clears throat> um, did anyone else? Uh, I, I did not have a hard time hearing Mike, but did anyone else um, have a hard time hearing Mike? Oh, OK, OK. Um, wondering if we should revisit some of what you said, but I'm not sure which part that was. Um, do you, who had a hard time hearing him, do you recall which which part that was roughly? I don't, I thought it was mostly okay. There was just a few minutes where it seemed like his, uh, he, he didn't have a, a strong enough connection or something, but uh, I think it was able to track it. I was able to track it pretty well. Okay. Um, Jay or Donna, go ahead, Jay. Yeah, yeah, what Jack said. I don't think it, it was just the uh, choppiness of the internet connection, and I don't oh. think I missed anything gotcha. substantive. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, agree with Jack. Okay. And Donna, anything to add to that? Well, I missed it, and you know, Mike has every word counts because he really explains his stuff well. <laughs> I just wanted to know if there's a way we can have a system versus just interrupting people saying, hey, I can't hear you. Um, is, is there something we could use for mojit, you know, reaction that we all know that's what it means? Because maybe it's just my computer, but I don't know, you know, but if we saw several of us with that up, then we'd know that there was more than one person having a problem. Maybe a cup here emoji. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's, that's good. That, that would be useful. Um, Thank you. I, and Phyllis, I'm glad that you brought up the southern facing uh, buildings again. Uh, I just I realize that this is not a part of <clears throat> um, this uh, set of zoning uh, amendments, but <clears throat> it seems to me that uh, I, I'm, I will just offer this for the, the planning um, commission's consideration, but it seems to me that for solar compatibility, you would always want to um, a, let a house be uh, facing south. Um, and so requiring a house to face a certain direction um, might limit uh, compatibility with solar. And 
anyway, as such, I, I don't, I would, I would be wary of any requirements in any, you know, PUDs that, that require an orientation. Um, yeah, go ahead. Mike. Yeah, so just let me, uh, I'll, I'll give just one um, other quick example of what's in the new neighborhood PUD. Um, that could be a problem. It's, it, you know, I'll just give it to you. I'll, I'll read it to you, but it's 3404E number two. And so I'll just read it. It's the development shall include a mix of housing types, including both single unit and multi-unit structures. And no more than 75% of the dwelling units may be of the same type. So what that, what, you know, as the developers were considering the, this project, what they were looking at were apartments. They, they wanted to be able to, to build in, I don't know, eight to 10 to 12 unit, that's what they're just chewing on. Um, but let's say they built 40 units. Well, by the definition of that, they'll have to make 10 of them single family homes and put them on single family lots. And it's, it's just, you know, you're just like, well, that's not what we're looking for. Um, you know, they could if they wanted to, but by this zoning, by the way the new neighborhood development is required, they would have to do it that way. Um, and and the issue, that's the issue they were coming up with, is there are a number of these that are really, the rules were designed for somebody coming in with a very large project where you would, you know, we didn't want somebody to come in and build out an entire, um, and I think that was actually when it was considered, it was actually thinking of the inverse. We'll put that rule in so somebody can't come in and build a hundred single family homes, they've got to make some of them multifamily. But the reality is what we have are people who want to build because we're trying to make um, affordable housing units. Um, single family homes are the least affordable to build. Um, it's only when you start putting them into um, multifamily units that you start to bring down that affordability cost um, such that it, it becomes an affordable project. And I think um, requiring them to then build single family homes is, is probably not what we would want as a policy. And I think that's what the planning commission, when they look through these rules, there are a number of these to go through and say, yeah, we probably don't want to make everybody do that. Um, but the new neighborhood is good. If you want the density bonuses of a new neighborhood, then you're going to have to meet these rules. But this project doesn't need any density bonuses. Um, they could build 300 units in that lower thing. They're not proposing it. Let me put that on top. That's not what they're talking about. But under the zoning of a fully built out lower 15 acres could have 300 units. They don't, they don't need a density bonus because they're not doing anything near that amount. Um, so therefore, that's, that's just, just as an example. So people kind of get a sense. Okay. So any further comments from council on the uh, potential zoning amendments? Uh, Dan, go ahead, yeah. and then Jack. Well, mine's more of a procedural one, so if Jack has a substantive one, I, I can let him go first. Okay. Well, it's it's not not very big. It's just that uh, I I appreciate the uh, the memo about uh, the uh, temporary occupancy uh, Airbnb VRBO, but uh, I do think from from the perspective of uh, housing advocates in Montpelier, there's a real concern that uh, this kind of use uh, is having an effect on uh, on the rental housing market. And we're not talking about doing anything here, but uh, we, we may want to be looking at some type of regulation because of that impact on uh, on rental housing. Yeah, I'll look forward to seeing what, what you all come up with about that. And I, I agree, Jack. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I guess Jack's actually reminded me uh, of a substantive point. Um, and I agree with, with Jack is that, you know, if we, and I think Mike's memo is really helpful in plotting a direction towards that, which is, you know, if we do start to get into any type of regulation of the Airbnb market, I think um, you know, what it's, what I've always viewed it as is it's, it's a continuum uh, of different uses and, and having, 
having one set of regulatory rules or one set of, I mean, I think communities that have done that have had issues. Um, and really what we're talking about are, are um, you know, people's giving people the maximum amount of flexibility in how they use their property um, without creating issues that uh, disturb the quiet enjoyment of other properties or have collateral impacts that are unanticipated um, on use of city services or similar. So I think, you know, I think that's a, certainly the memo is a good arrow um, for how we're gonna go forward. The procedural question that I had um, was just maybe a reminder that, uh, you know, I am recusing myself from any of the zoning changes involving Saban's pasture um, because of a conflict. Um, so I had announced that last time and then I would just ask that if we do have a motion or a vote on these that we break them out, um, the Saban's pasture pieces separate from the remaining zoning changes. Yes, thank you for that reminder. Uh, okay, just in terms of, uh, uh, again, procedure. Um, so from here, one potential is that we could um, have a motion to approve uh, the proposed changes, um, uh, or we don't need any further um, hearings on this, is that correct? You're not required to have hearings, but you certainly always have the option to hold further hearings if you feel you want and need more hearings. Okay. Uh, all right, so um, uh, th since uh, I think we did sort of uh, run out of um, public comment earlier, um, actually I'll just check one more time. Any, anyone else from the public wish to weigh in on this? Okay, um, so then with that, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Um, Council, what would you like to do? Uh, Jack, go ahead. I feel ready to, to move forward with this. And so uh, I, I would be happy to uh, first move that we approve. Uh, I don't have the text in front of me, unfortunately, but I would, approve the uh, proposed changes that do not relate to Saban's pasture. And I, if the clerk thinks that's good enough to uh, indicate in the minutes what we're approving, fine. If not, I, we can, I can fix it a little bit. Uh, Donna. I could second it and add the words to the unified development regulations is what it says in the agenda. But, okay, Jack agrees. And John, that is sufficient as a motion? Um, I mean, I'm not sure how to respond to that. It's, it's, it's your motion. Um, if you want me to reference, uh, you to reference stuff in the, that was in the packet or something, I can, I can certainly do that. Yeah, I think that makes sense too. Uh, well, the recommended action on the agenda says motion to approve the proposed changes to the unified development regulations. Uh, but we're trying to pull out the portions um, relevant to Saban's pasture. Oh, Saban's pasture, oh, sections, I got it. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, sounds fine to me. I don't know that any, I mean, I don't know if I some of the think about it, but it seems pretty straightforward. Yeah, I think as long as it's clear, I think we're probably yeah. good. Um, Dan, yes? Yeah, my understanding is that this motion covers everything but the Saban's Pasture articles, and then the next motion would presumably take care of those articles, um, and that the two motions together would approve everything, or you seek to approve everything. Yeah. Um, okay, um, so there's a motion and a second. So this is about everything, um, uh, the uh, amendments that do not include uh, parts relevant to Saban's Pasture. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, so that uh, is approved then. Anything um, further? Yes, Jack. I move that we 
uh, approve the amendments to the unified zoning regulation related to savings pasture. Second. We got a motion and a second. Um, I'm going to offer uh, <laughs> approval, um, opposing, and also abstaining. Um, just so you know. Uh, any further discussion on this part? Uh, yes, Lauren. Yeah, I just, I really appreciate Mike's presentation and the ability to put forward, I think, you know, some of some issues that came up last week about, I know, you know, Phyllis was raising issues around traffic and design. And I, I left last week feeling really confident that there is still going to be robust review and that there's there's going to be a lot of opportunity to ensure this, you know, any project that does move forward is, um, you know, done in the best possible way for the community with, you know, lots of considerations in mind. Um, so I, I feel good about that. And I'm really excited to move forward with uh, potential opportunities for uh, more affordable housing. I'm hearing, you know, we all hear what a cry there is for that in our community. So just appreciation to planning department for all the work that went into this um, and we'll be voting for it. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you. Um, all right, any further discussion? Uh, okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? And abstaining? Aye. Okay, so we're going to, because it was not unanimous, we're going to go through it on the roll and I'm going to call you in the order in which you show up on my screen. So you don't you know, you never know what that's going to be. Uh, so here we go. Um, Dan. I abstain. Jack. I. Jay. I. Lauren. I. Donna. I. Connor. I. Okay, so the uh, motion uh, passes and thank you very much again, Mike, for your work. And please pass along our thanks to uh, the planning commission as well and all, all the work that they do. And uh, yeah, knowing that our, the work is not done. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate that. Um, thank you. Yep. Have a good night. Um, unless you're on still, I don't know. Maybe you are. Um, so moving on to, uh, oh, actually it's eight. <laughs> It is 8.48. Do you need a break? Do, do you want to keep plowing? Donna says yes. I think a okay. break is fine. Okay, let's take a break. Um, so we're going to um, take, what, five minutes? Is five minutes okay? All right, five minutes, which is not terribly long. That puts us back at 8.53. Okay, see you soon. A minute late, no. All right, well, let's, um, let's bring it back here. And uh, so we are up to uh, the, the temporary parklet ordinance. Um, so for this, I assume it's Bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. So hopefully this is pretty simple. Uh, you may recall that last summer um, when the pandemic was first hitting or, or sit, settling in, I guess, um, we were looking at ways to allow businesses to expand a little bit and get some more real estate downtown, um, whether it was outdoor seating or we even envisioned perhaps outdoor, uh, you know, using parking spaces for sales that didn't really happen. Um, and so we put in a temporary ordinance that, that basically set aside our normal ordinance and replaced it for a set period of time and that that ordinance expired on October 25th, which was also the date by which all the parklets were supposed to come in. So we've since reverted back to our normal uh, parklet ordinance, which is a little bit more cumbersome and requires a lot more detail. Um, and I think the intent of that was, was well intentioned. We all expected that this summer we would be looking at a more normal situation uh, back to business as usual. And that not being the case, it's clear that the pandemic is gonna have its, its effect this summer. So our staff is, and we've gotten some feedback from the downtown folks. Our staff is recommending that we simply put back the temporary ordinance again this summer uh, to go from May 1st to October 25th, which is the normal parklet season. And it would have the more relaxed standards. Uh, it, 
in it. So it's essentially identical to uh, what we did last summer, which I think was pretty successful. There's one change that I did propose. It doesn't really have a cross out or strike out. So I wanted to call that out. Last year's, last year's uh, temporary ordinance had a clause in it that said, if we start charging for parking, um, people who are using parklets may be charged the cost of the foregone parking, you know, the revenue that the city is losing from the parking spaces. And we did hear from a couple of folks that said that they were uncertain about doing it because of that, that uncertainty, that that was a cost they weren't, didn't really want to. So I've just proposed to take that out, that if we're going to do this, let's, um, let's just make it available to our businesses. This isn't, you know, we're not exactly rolling in the cash with our parking right now. Um, and I imagine there, you know, unless something drastically changes, we won't have, we'll still have available parking spaces. Um, but that seemed to me, given what we know now about the likely user hood of this, which is, you know, I think we can probably expect the same folks as last year, maybe one, one or two more, but not, it's not going to be all over town um, as much as we might want it to be. And so to me, that made sense. But if, if you'd like to put that clause back in, um, you know, we will have a second reading on this on March 10. Uh, so we can amend that for that here reading. Um, otherwise, it's the identical regulation as last year. Um, Jack and then Connor. Thanks. I think this is great. Um, I have two points. One, did we open the public hearing on this? <laughs> nope, not yet, but I'm going to officially open the public hearing right now. Thank you. <laughs> Good that was just the explanation for the public before we opened the public hearing. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the second thing is, as I was going over this, um, one thing that occurred to me, and I wonder if, uh, Bill, if you or anyone has an opinion on this, there's, there's the provision that says that uh, in par paragraph D, uh, parklets will be limited to two parking spaces for business and must be proximate to the main business location. And um, it, there are a number of places that talk about uh, businesses, but uh, I was thinking, well, would a parklet have to be related to a business? For instance, could somebody decide that uh, this is an opportunity to apply for a parklet and the purpose of the parklet would be to provide parking spaces for bicycles? And uh, I didn't, I'm looking at it, I didn't see anything that, uh, that would prohibit that. And I think it might be an interesting use if some, uh, if some of the bicycle advocates in town wanted to try doing that. I wonder what, what you think of that. Um, I mean, I think providing, you know, parking spaces for bicycles is a great idea. Um, you know, this was, we're, we're, all right, so let me go back. When we first started talking about parklets, we talked about pro public park parklets versus private park parklets. So the idea was that if the city wanted to provide a public park that would be a place where people could sit and gather you may recall we tried we had the one on state street for a slight season that it might include uh, a bicycle parking those kinds of things those would be for publicly used and then there were the private parklets which were essentially extension of businesses so uh, and as we've seen they've primarily been for restaurants uh, type places to, to have additional outdoor seating uh, it hasn't really I think gelled with people putting like out merchandise and those kinds of things. Um, but it could. The, the reason for the temporary um, art, uh, ordinance last summer to, to basically speed up the process, make it easier, have less hurdles to, to gather. And, and remember the state put out new guidelines for this last year too as well. So it was to, because that was relaxing some VTRAN standards was to help businesses in, in, in a pandemic. So I think while there would be nothing to prevent someone from doing that, uh, I could picture 
other businesses feeling that taking up parking spaces for bicycle parking, you know, there might be some debate about that, whether that was beneficial to the businesses or harmful. Um, you know, I think you could argue that either way, right? If you've got more bicycles, then more people can come downtown, park their bikes and shop. Uh, others may feel like, hey, that's one parking, you know, you can put multiple bikes in one parking space, but you can't put, you can only put one car. So I think you could, you know, I don't personally have a strong feeling about it, but the, the reason we did this was to help businesses. And so the reason for the part proximate to the business was, you know, didn't want one store taking up parking spaces around the corner in front of another store for, you know, for their business. It's got to be, it's either related to your business or it's not. And, and, you know, it's got to be some rational uh, nexus there between the two. Um, Connor, but before you go, I mean, just, it's an interesting question, Jack, and I, I feel multiple ways about it simultaneously somehow. And, you know, I almost want to say like, let's let somebody propose it and then go right. through that. Cause I can't imagine there would be very many of those. Right. It would require, I mean, essentially a bit, if a business wanted to say, we'd like to use the parking spot in front of our business to have bike parking, why not? Yeah. Let a hundred flowers bloom, let a hundred schools of thought contend. <laughs> um, Connor, go ahead. And then Donna. Yeah, no, th thanks for all this, Bill. It looks really good. And uh, I would definitely be in favor of uh, leaving out the uh, charging them for parking line as you recommended. Had a question on the first line. It says existing parklets as of the effective date. Does that mean parklets that had been in existence the previous year there? Um, I just wanted to So there were parklets, parklets that had been approved under the more formal process. And there were only a couple. Uh, essentially, it's the, it was the positive pie parklet um, and the formerly the um, down home parklet, which has now been moved to Jay Morgan's. So those two were both approved under the, the sort of the more stringent process with, with the limited number of parking spaces. You know, we only had, we only allowed six down in the whole downtown, six spaces, and those took five up. And, um, and that there were certain structural standards and those kinds of things that had to be met. You know, VTrans has allowed less structural, you know, possibilities. So I think, um, so, so the idea was those people don't have to go, th you know, it just basically, they, they were approved for, I think, three-year periods. And so they had last summer on pause and the idea that they would have this summer on pause too. So it wouldn't count against their three years. That, that makes the... sense. Yep, great, thanks. Anna, go ahead. Uh, yes, I'm glad you brought that one up. I'm glad that you took away the fee and that you also have in there about, you, you still need a certain width and without that, then they can't have it. People right. need to have the sidewalks. That's great. That was in last summer. Yes, that's. I just noticed it more clearly. It's just really good. And my res, I would say bikes parklets would definitely have a, a lower priority than any business because we do have bike racks, and we need more. We we can do more. Um, so I would not want them to be in the same level of pedestrian and sitting space. A sitting space we're really looking for, I think, and people supporting the businesses and the stores downtown, and particularly now, to, so people can see a more vibrancy as people gather, even when we gathered at a distance, uh, that I really want to see the park used for that primarily. Um, Lauren and then Donna? Yeah, thanks. Um, one one downtown business owner had raised to me a question. So this is somebody who um, does not have a parklet, likes the idea of them, appreciated them, and what they allowed for other downtown businesses. The question that was raised was the timing. Um, and I don't know if you got feedback from businesses. Were they really using them all the way until October 25th? I'm sure in any given year, depending on weather, it might or might not be <laughs> uh, very pleasant to be using them. Um, if, you know, for outdoor seating at restaurants or whatever, but um, 
So just wanted to to raise that because somebody had asked if you know if we're going to start it potentially earlier and get them going um, on the other end for the for the businesses that it does you know in in some way make accessing some of them a little bit more challenging potentially if there's any thought on on timeline. Um, so I don't know if you got any yeah, feedback on that so timeline. The May one to eight twenty. So the May first to October twenty fifth timeline is what the full-time ordinance calls for. Uh, I think there, I've actually heard from some businesses that would like to get out there before May 1. I think we've always said May 1 just to, because you know, there could be an April snow storm. Um, you know, you just don't know. October 25th was the date that had been set by the council. I think when it was initially said, it was actually November 1st or October 31st. And we got some pushback on that, but then people felt that you know, it had to go through Columbus weekend or excuse me, Indigenous People's Day weekend because that's a big tourist weekend. And, you know, the 25th seemed like the compromise between November 1st and that weekend. I will say that at least last year, uh, there was, there were a couple that, two that were out that actually went a, a little bit beyond the 25th. I mean, they it wasn't, they weren't being horrible about it. They just didn't get them out but they were a day or two late. So I, I would say that the 25th, they, they were still using them right up until October 25th last year. I mean, you know, maybe in a normal year when there's plenty of inside seating and everything else, yeah, it's getting a little chilly. Let's let's pull them in early. But I think is as long as these conditions exist, you know, outside seating, people will be out um, as much as they, as they can, you know. Um, in any, you know, a day like today, maybe somebody might have been out with a heater, <laughs> you know, 45 degrees. Um, so. Yeah. Um, Donna and then Dan and then Jay. Thank you. I just um, I wanted to share with you that um, last year on Langdon Street, we had significant um, pushback when we um, took even half an additional space um, away from parking. So while I love the idea of um, having more um, bicycle parking downtown, I just, I just wanted to let people know um, that when we couldn't, we actually pulled back and, and there were multiple conversations um, about whether that was appropriate to have more um, slightly more space. So I think that there are certain areas um, in the downtown where businesses could get pretty prickly. No, that's good to know. Thank you. Um, Dan and then Jay. Sure. Um, uh, I, I heard similar feedback to what Lauren heard. Um, as far as, you know, certain businesses wanting, if we're going to start earlier, to end earlier. But I, I think it really depends upon weather. Um, and of course, we don't know now businesses may um, invest in these heaters, these outdoor heaters, so that they'll look to extend and push. Um, and I think, you know, this, this is intended really as a creative solution to a difficult problem and to enable businesses, particularly restaurants, um, to have have accessibility and to be able to seat people outside safely. So, you know, I'm certainly in favor of um, a thoughtful approach that would allow um, people to take advantage of the systems when they were um, reasonable. I think the other concern that I would have is, you know, if we do let it go to October 25th um, and we do get a cold winter coming earlier next year or fall, um, it almost seems like some of these, some of this should be seasonal determinant. You know, when we talk about bringing them on earlier than May 1st, you know, if it's a really warm April, that, that might be important, especially if it's a rainy June. Um, or, you know, if it's cold in October, or if we get a warm streak in October, of October all the way, um, all the way to the end, that would be, you know, I, I don't want to necessarily rewrite this. Uh, on the fly, but it, it, it does strike me that some of these seasonal conditions may play into it. The, the other thing that I guess I'm concerned about is, is something that did occur on Langdon Street last year, which is 
my recollection is that we approved these, the both the uh, Langdon Street Tavern, or you approved the Langdon Street Tavern seating and also the Sweet Melissa's, but then they didn't end up using it. Um, and there was a period of time where there was a lot of empty barricades along Langdon Street taking up parking places um, that just weren't used. It was kind of, it, it looked like, it looked like a rock concert that never happened uh, or the lineup for one. Um, I'm wondering, you know, would you want the power or ability, or do you feel that you lack it to step in if in fact someone does seek that type of uh, a parklet, but then either doesn't use it or uses it in a way that's inconsistent with what we're trying to, to create here? Uh can I just jump in uh, and I, I, I want to own that one because, uh, you know, we, we did work initially to look to close at least a portion of Langdon Street. Um, Sweet Melissa's looked like it was possible to open back up again. So we did leave the spaces up there for probably two or three weeks, I want to say. But like a lot of businesses, it just the, the pieces weren't coming together for Sweet Melissa's and they weren't able to open. So, you know, I just want to take responsibility for that. It's, yeah, and you recall, we looked at a lot of, you know, we talked about the possibility, you know, we, we did spend a fair amount of time, a couple of meetings, I think, talking about configurations on Langdon Street. Right. And, and so the, the attempt was to maybe block half of it and make it more pedestrian. And, and I think my view for this year would be if Langdon Street Tavern wants to have a parklet, it would have a parklet ease and we can work with them and if we have to put the barricades up for them great but I don't think we need to take out a whole lot of more parking space you know, as you recall we allowed them to go actually out into the street um, and then we took the parking away on the other side to allow the traffic uh, and I think that we probably if that's the proposal again I'd probably want to bring that one back to the council to and, and you know and have a hearing with the, the street owners again um, I'm not sure you know, they're yeah. uh, fully successful. You know, I mean, I, I felt that what eventually settled, and maybe this was just a sort of trial and error, certainly what settled with the Langdon Street Tavern worked eventually with the barricades. And it know, worked in the Langdon Street Tavern well because, you know, they had, in addition to the sort of parking space seating, they actually had seating out in half, half a lane of, tra of traffic. So they had plenty of seating. I'd be interested to hear, especially now that there's different retail across the street, mm -hmm. um, how the loss of parking, you know, we had to take that left hand lane of parking away in order to maintain the traffic through there. Right. Um, and so there was loss of parking on both sides of the street. And, you know, maybe that's fine, maybe it's not, but I think that would be a, a considered conversation to have before we just approved anything other than the park the parking space parklets that are in this ordinance I, I would definitely feel like that expanded consideration would need to come back to you folks I wouldn't just approve that um, Madam Jane, Mayor side oh. sorry well, there's a kind of a line forming here um, Jay and then Lauren and then Donna and then Stephen all right um, so I guess I, I would uh, echo Lauren and Dan and, and other thoughts around um, how do we deal with sort of the arbitrary dates of May 1st and, and going into October being making sure, you know, arbitrary, but just seasonal dates and wanting to give businesses opportunities to um, have that extra space and be flexible based on what, if, if they think it will help them bring um, new customers. Now, if you're uh, a restaurant and are seating people, you, you know, after the end of October or before May, that it may not work for your business. But if you had an opportunity to do a little pop-up shop or some sort of to-go type of opportunity on a really warm weekend to draw people, it could create a structure. And if you had something in place, you know, I do think that um, opening that window, I think would be, um, a positive thing let the businesses decide what what is going to work best for them because lord knows that you know the, the way the weather and seasons change so quickly um if they can find something that worked then, then i think that'd be great the other thing is and, and i kind of want to come back to um uh 
paragraph D that, that Jack had brought up, but from a different perspective, uh, um, sort of the idea of what proximate means. Um, the last thing I want to do is uh, sort of complicate the, the process, and I want to promote this type of opportunity for every business possible, and I think it's great, but I, I, I did hear from a business owner this past summer who, ha who happened to be right next to a uh, a business that that put their installed a parklet and it was installed in the appropriate spot given the drains and the angle of the road and all of that and it would be considered proximate to their business but it, it ended up right in front of the business next to them and they didn't know about it until it they walk, showed up the next day and and there it was or the, the work was starting um, and they felt that that really hindered their business so I'm not trying to create tension between business owners, but I want to be fair where it, I don't know if we can write into this that there's some level of communication. If proximate doesn't mean the two spots that are right in front of your business, um, then then I, I feel like we owe, you know, it's not just be, you know being a good neighbor, but I feel like we we owe it to the other businesses to be able to, you know, have some sort of conversation about how the the structure the design etc um certain places it's easy there's spots or it's right in front of the business and it's it's level and and there you go but others it's not as clean so um i don't want to cause i don't want to get it make it more complicated but i do think i want to make sure we're being fair to all the businesses thanks yeah, yeah that, that's a complication you know we had i mean the 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 actual ordinance requires notice and hearing and they come to the council and they get it approved and people have the opportunity to comment and this was specifically designed to sort of make it fast and easy for people to be able to respond and just quickly i know there's a bunch of people who are in comment you know as far as the date goes there's no magic to it if the council wants to move the date up or you know have us look at something for the next reading about how to word something we certainly can do that then I just used the dates that had existed because last year we didn't approve of this till like June. So we just said from now till October 25th. And so I figured we needed a start date. So I just tied it to the prior start date, but it really, you know, April one is when we end the winter parking stuff. So, so oh, I'm, I'm going to save my comment because there's a line. All right. So um, uh, Lauren, go ahead. Uh, yeah. One, one thought and one question. Um, this is just making me think of like, is there an opportunity if we're having these parklets, like saying this a little tongue in cheek, but like put up the my ride ad, like some of the cars that are parking downtown are people like me who sometimes drive downtown to to go shopping when I could be taking advantage of our great free, uh, you know, door to door transit program. So, um, you know, as much as we can be promoting that, um, hopefully we can be easing some of this where it's not creating a lot of some of the tension that Jay was just talking about, if we're opening up more spaces, um, still, you know, people who are coming in from out of town and need to be driving for whatever reason. Um, so just if there's if there's ways to build in promotion of that and but making sure that everybody far and wide in the in the community knows how to how to take advantage of that great new service. Um, so my question, so last summer I know it was. Um, you know, we had thought maybe some more retailers would be able to take advantage and it was challenging. Just wondering if you're hearing anything about, you know, now that people have had time to think about and plan longer, you know, we were obviously like shut down for part of that window. This is happening late in the season. So it might not have felt worth figuring out some way to, you know, truck inventory in and out and build a structure and all of that. And just, just curious if you're hearing from people or would anticipate you know, more demand for this, um, knowing that there's more time to plan for it? Or are you thinking it's, you know, from what you're hearing from um, from businesses and like those same challenges that are going to be there. So we would, we're not anticipating a run on applications for this as far as you can tell at this moment. We're not hearing that, but you know, it's early yet. So um, we could certainly talk to Dan Groberg and have him put feelers out. I think the biggest hurdle that we heard from businesses last summer, and I suspect it would be the same, was they felt that there would be a need to have a staff person outside with the inventory. And they couldn't really afford to have two, you know, two people on, one in and one out. Um, if they can figure out a way to 
deal with that. And I, you know, and I know to some extent people put merchandise out on sidewalks and it's not staffed. So, but maybe that's different than having it all the way across the sidewalk into a parking space. So, um, you know, it might be possible that, you know, I could, I don't know, we'd have to, we'd have to look at some of the options. I mean, on one hand, someone could maybe expand their sidewalk space and people could walk around through the, the parking uh, spots, but then we have to make sure that they're properly ramped. Uh, I did, I did observe last summer, you know, once this took flight, I saw some temporary ramps that were used in a few different places. Um, I, I think I shared them with Donna and, you know, we might be able to figure out how that could work. Well, we haven't heard much, you know, about it yet. Okay. I mean, I just, part of why I'm asking is it, it does, you know, it, it kind of continues the, the existing ones, but then puts, the burden on you all to be making a case by case call and if it becomes more complicated like is that is there more guidance or is there a cap or you know, like more anything more explicit we would want to put in so that it doesn't become like you're having to pick in some way that might feel arbitrary to businesses i don't think it's any different than it was last summer and we'll see what you know my, my you know it's your policy my view would be we want to make this as open and as um, flexible as possible for people. This is still a business crisis period. And, um, you know, I, I do understand that there is uh, sometimes a, a other business concern about park loss of parking spaces. Um, you know, last summer was brand new, but I would, you know, just looking at this right now, um, there certainly is no lack of parking downtown. I mean, it's steady, but you, you can find parking, the parking lots have extra spaces it's not like it's it's um full and you know without knowing what the state's going to do as far as bringing employees back um you know that really drives the demand for parking downtown as much as anything so and you know i i also think this is just this is no science to this is just my personal opinion but if there is more seating for restaurants and things like that then those are people that may also then be shopping in other shops if they've come downtown to to do those things. No, fair enough. Um, Donna. Sometimes you need to add the last name. Maybe I'll have you call me Bate from now on. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so I had a question about staffing. I feel the dates are important because it gives staff a, a, a schedule. It gives businesses a schedule. The weather is the weather and it's always going to be fluky, but I think if we make it too flexible, we're back to doing what we did with the winter ban when we're trying to make all these last minute decisions. And I feel that so far these dates have worked pretty well and the weather has cooperated and some people have chosen to stop using their parklet or earlier than the date set because it's cold. Someone like Julio's will use it until we kick him off the street because it, it's the life of his business. He has no indoor seating. Uh, so I, I feel it's important though that we think of our staff's time as well as the business staff needs also a schedule as to when they're gonna have more weight staff, less, less weight staff. Um, and I do- Can I just answer that quickly? So from our perspective, as long as there is a date, it's not, you know, I wasn't necessarily saying we rig up something um, complicated. I'm just saying if the council wants to move the date till April 15 or April 1 or whatever, I, it's fine with us. To, yeah, oh no, I, I've been around for all of this. Yeah. For us. yeah, yeah, and this and the city council has talked about this date from the day one we opened this. Longer, shorter. I mean, it's it's never been perfect. Um, but also, Bill, maybe I need to, I missed, I don't remember the, all the discussion, but was Langdon Street have to have the cars moved away from the sitting because the structure of the parklet was not so substantial? I just no, don't understand. No, was Langdon Street was. Need we're... more space from cars than all the others. No, we were, to, you may recall, the council was trying to create some kind, you know, see this as a potential to look what Langdon Street might be able to do and it, it didn't really play out that way. And, and so what happened was we, the city, allowed the Langdon Street Tavern and we were going to allow Sweet Melissa's to do the same thing. In addition to the parking spaces in front of their business, they were actually allowed to use the street. They, they, were, they had a wider area. So, so we 
So in order to do that, we barricaded them off, but that required taking parking away on the other side of the street to get cars by. Yeah, but we're not proposing that this year is my point. So I, they wouldn't- No, and I, what I said is if that proposal yeah. comes back, I, I would ask the council to approve that. that is, I don't feel that that is within my authority to approve. Okay, but if we treat it the way normally it would be done, the street and across from the park, but parking spaces would still be there. So that would help people who feel like they're losing all their parking, not lose as much parking as they did last year. That's right. They would just have the two yeah. parking spaces like anybody else. Yes, that's what I would propose for Langdon Street um, mm, yeah. this year. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stephen, go ahead. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So w one of the key things you need to actually agree to and, and define uh, your enforcement protocol. And I want to point to a number of uh, trouble areas. Uh, Rabble Rouser wasn't using the sidewalk uh, for seating, and yet they put the steel planters out there at the maximum distance with no uh, warning or protection. And I was watching people slam into these 100 pound steel, you know, planters full of dirt and, you know, bleed, their knees were bleeding, you know, their sh shins. And I moved them against the wall several times after five o'clock. And, you know, it, it, it was unclear. The council uh, hadn't defined it. The police didn't know what to do. It's like, you, you, you know, you're, you're not, the purpose of this is not to create hazards for the walking public. Uh, secondly, the down in front of uh, Jay Morgan's, there wasn't five feet of clearance. You know, they put, you know, attendance stands and all kinds of, you know, there's, a, there's lamp posts and fire hydrants down there. It got down to like three feet of passageway. And that's a problem. Um, that's also not down homes. That's not down homes, uh, parklet anymore so it's not grandfathered in as far as your three-year permit it's a different business with a different you know licensing requirement uh, even the council voted to transfer that approval but uh secondly the uh the size limitation and the after hours use uh the after hours use i raised it the question of the, I think the official ordinance, the, the permanent ordinance or the experimental ordinance had that after the business was closed, that the public got to use the public space. The public parking places is public right of way. And yet I watched, saw a business uh, try to say, this is private property. You can't sit here. You can't, you know, loiter here. You're on camera, et cetera, et cetera. And I raised it with Bill, and it was like, oh, well, the temporary ordinance doesn't address that issue. So the temporary ordinance does need to address that issue. We, you know, you don't go allowing taking of public property uh, because, well, while the business isn't using it, uh, that's just not right. Uh, secondly, is the size of the three penny. Uh, that's that's a huge deck, and it's in front of a a neighboring business. I think that's the one that uh, one of your council members was referring to. It's like they, it, it wasn't moved over in front of the two storefronts of Three Penny. It's over in front of the antique store where our former mayor has a, a booth. So that that one, it took the, the only parking available for that business, which is cr crucial. And nobody seems to have any notice requirements or any warning or any obligation to move that one over, you know? But to, while we're talking about parking, I sure hope some, somebody's billing Jacobs for the spaces on Elm Street where I have to walk out in the street to avoid the hazard he creates with his, you know, unmaintained roof, uh, you know, freezing an entire sidewalk section. So these are all related issues, but you, you need to deal with the after hours. You need to deal with the encroachment upon other businesses' essential parking um, and the policing of the uh, or enforcement of not maintaining the five feet of clearance and what happens after hours. Or I think the solution we finally arrived at with Rabble Rouser was convincing Jackie, uh, unlike her uh, obstinate uh, partner there, 
to put some barrels. So at least the barrels were visible and higher. And if you hit the barrel, it would move, it, you know, old whiskey barrels. Uh, the barrel wouldn't, it, it was rounded. It wasn't sharp. It wasn't as heavy. And it would move if you ran into it rather than break, break skin. So these are all issues. Those are public safety issues. Oh, and as far as the, you know, to hear Bill talk about the, the emergency, the urgency of this issue, as long as y'all aren't making bathrooms available for people to crap, there's new human crap on the sidewalk today, uh, and it stays a lot much longer in this kind of weather, uh, and no place to wash your hands, uh, you're, you're, you're blowing in the wind. So um, I just, I got to point out your hypocrisy on those matters. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Um, it is an interesting point about the use of the sidewalk, Bill. What is the how does uh, what uh, governs that? Rousers issue. Rail Rouser did not did not use the Parkwood ordinance. I'm trying to. I'd have to go back and look at the record. I think. I think they. They thought that that stuff was approved as part of their zoning permit, but I'm, I'm going to have to take a look at that because they, they wanted landscaping out there. So, I mean, Stephen's right. They shouldn't be in the, the walkway. Uh, and um, with hazard, you know, we have to maintain that distance. But we, the five-foot distance that we use is not a, a city requirement. It's a guideline and, you know, it's a requirement in this ordinance, but we don't actually have any real teeth to say other than ADA violation to say you can't have something here. So, you know, we've We've talked about that, but we've never actually put in that regulation. So they were not, that wasn't related to the parklet thing. That was something that happened uh, there, you know, with regard to Jay Morgan's, um, you know, their their parklet was in the parking spaces. Uh, so the, the sidewalk space was the sidewalk space. Um, Three Penny did, was complicated. I think that's the one that Connor was talking about. Um, where, or excuse me, Jay, not Connor. Um, and, and there were some real complications with that. You know, the, those are angle parking. All the others are, are parallel parking. So two parking spaces with angle parking is, a, you know, a different geometry. And it is also in that particular area, there is a sloped, uh, the roadway slopes. So there were issues with where they you know, their initial place where they wanted was going to block drainage. Um, which would flood, you know. So DPW worked with them to find the optimal place to put it, and that's where it was. I, I do appreciate that it had impact on the neighboring business. I mean, one of the one of the conundrums with this ordinance in all of these is that um, no, you know, people businesses tend to think of the parking spot in front of their business as theirs, but really they're all public parking spaces, and often people park ten spaces down before they walk to you know to go to a different business. Um, and, and so, and we've always sort of promoted, hey, that's not your parking space. And now we're kind of saying, well, you can have the couple in front of you <laughs> as your parking spaces, at least for, for this summer. And so, you know, I, I think that's the reason we did this on a temporary basis to, before we institutionalize this in the long run, we probably would want to put more detail in, as Jay mentioned, you know, maybe a more stringent approval process and notice and all that. I mean, I think the question is, are, are we interested in having this be the quick process that we had, given that we're still in a pandemic versus are we, you know, are we looking at a more, um, maybe an ex, you know, instead of limiting us to six parking spaces, maybe it's 20 or whatever. And we go, you know, we, we have it become a more formal process. And that, again, that's up to the council. Yeah, my hope is that we would increase the number of parklets. I think they are, um, you know, I think it was uh, Donna Bate who was saying, uh, you know, that we want to see the vibrancy of, of people downtown. And, and I think having more parklets helps uh, just raise the visibility that people are out and um, partaking in downtown. So, um, so just in answer to your question, Bill, I mean, my gut about this right now is that it's still okay to um, have this be sort of the expedited uh, process, but it's if it is sort of becoming clear that like okay no we are we're going to need to um, to deal with some some things um, can't go on uh, indefinitely. Um, 
you know, in terms of the dates, <clears throat> um, I am, I, I remember that debate about when the end date ought to be and remember what you were saying, Bill, about uh, the compromise date of uh, October 25th. So I, I don't feel, I don't feel like that needs to move necessarily. If anything, you know, my, my gut again, for the, the sake of these, uh, these restaurants that have uh, really tough conditions right now, um, I would maybe want to extend it on the front end if possible. And for, for that, I, I feel conflicting things and uh, which is to say that, um, I, I mean, I judge how, how, like, is the weather good enough for being outside by when are we playing ultimate uh, in the spring? Like, when can we go outside for ultimate? And that is pretty consistently like the last week in April. Um, and so it is, you know, it is earlier than, uh, than May 1st, not a ton earlier, but I agree that last snowstorm in, in April, I mean, that, if that feels consistent. And what I think would be really bad is if we had a snowstorm and we needed to plow and there were these um, uh, parklets out, that feels like a, so, and we, we know like the end of April can be pretty tumultuous. So I, I, uh, I feel like it's probably good in terms of the dates as it is. Um, yeah, I, I, have, I might have further thoughts, but anyway, um, that's, that's it for now. Any, anyone else? Well, you've got till March 10 to think it over. If you want to change the dates, you can do it at second reading. <laughs> That's right, because we, we can have a, a second reading for this. One one possibility is I, I uh, you know, did hear Stephen there about like the after hours use and wonder if it would be easy enough to just like grab the language from um, the original ordinance and put it in here just to clarify <clears throat> um, the, just the the expectations around after hours use, I think that makes sense. And there's pretty good language already around that, that we can, I, I don't anticipate that would um, be a encumbrance on. Um, so it, yeah. Well, it probably won't. I will point out that unlike, um, you know, the original parklets, the, the more permanent parklets were actually built, you know, with the seating built in for the most part. Uh, and, and they're, you know, a permanent type structure. Some of the temporaries, you know, they just, they built a platform and put tables and things on them. So what was happening is people were um, binding up the chairs and things and tables at night, you know, locking them up. So they would pull them all together and tie them up with a, a, a tie so that they wouldn't walk off. And so therefore you couldn't really sit in them because they were secured. Mm. Uh, so, you know, I, I also think that we want to be, you know, require people to leave their tables and chairs out in a way that someone could just steal them easily um, is probably not also. Um, so I think that was also some of the conflict. That right. Okay. No, that's a, that's a good point, um, which I, I think it, you know, we certainly don't want to require that, that uh, movable objects are just left out. Um, so, all right. Well, anyway, that's something that we can, um, consider for next time, I suppose. Uh, Dan, did you have a question or comment? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, when we think about the dates, it might be helpful if any of the businesses that, um, you know, have the, have used these structures, these parklets in the past, if they have a thought, um, about it, just simply because, you know, they may be fine with May 1st because it strikes me that, you know, e even even at May 1st, the only way you can sit outside as opposed to running around on the uh, ultimate field um, in all uh, that aerobic activity, uh, which is easier to do in cold weather because you're you're sweating and you're uh, as opposed to just sitting there and um, in, in colder weather is to see if any of these businesses want that earlier start or if they're planning on it or if that opportunity, because I mean, it's, if we were to, to mess with the, the dates and I think Bill's sort of uh, default provision from the old parklet is, is probably as good as any 
um, unless businesses said, no, no, we really want to get a, a jump on this. We'd like to get the park foot at least set up pre, you know, pre May 1st. Um, but that may also involve heaters or they may just not be interested in it because they know the weather is not going to really support it and people aren't going to sit there till you know, later in May. Um, same thing on the, on the backside as well. I mean, it'd just be helpful to see what the businesses want before we, we start tinkering with the dates. Um, I, I agree. And I think, you know, the biggest issue, you know, there's, there's the, what the business needs are, but then I think the, the snow plow, snow removal issue. I mean, I would think that certainly they, we'd have to have a provision that any, you know, we're not responsible for any damage in case a plow hits one of them or, and, or the business would have to clear all the snow uh, from around its parklet. I don't know where they're going to put it if, if you know, you know, throw it into another snow bank. So, you know, I think we'd have to think about that. On the other hand, I've certainly been hearing from at least one business who wants to know when they can get theirs back out. Uh, I mean, it sounds like they're pretty anxious to do so. I will say um, we went over to Stowe today. Uh, my kids were skating at the outdoor skating rink and my wife and I went and walked and, and there's a couple of restaurants and pubs there and they all had outside seating today and people were sitting at them and they had those big heaters going. Wow, that's something. I wonder if we had allowed, if we didn't have an end date, if people would have left them out. I don't know. It's an interesting question. I mean, those weren't in a place, you know, that was an enclosed area, an area where there's no plowing or anything, but uh, it was in that village at Spruce, you know, the kind of manufactured yeah. But nonetheless, they were definitely outdoor seating everywhere. They're being used. It's interesting. Um, all right, so um, where are we at here tonight? We could, uh, yeah, Jack, go ahead. So time to close the public hearing. Do you oh. we need a motion to set a new public hearing or you just do it? Yes, and if you want to give us direction on any changes to prepare, now would be the time to do so. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just asked that we maybe uh, meet with the Langdon Street Tavern owners before the next meeting to suss out that situation. Okay. Um, anyone else? Uh, Jack, go ahead. Yeah, and I would encourage uh, contact with Montpelier Alive to just see, see what the level of the interest is among uh, business owners. Yeah, I may I may be coming in with a proposed amendment regarding public or non-business uh, parklets. Okay, fair enough. Uh, and um, yeah, just thinking about how do we how do we phrase guidance around after hours use? I think could be useful if 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 possible. That'd <laughs> be great. Um, all right, Donna, go ahead. Maybe if you discuss some bit about how much of a structure that parklet had, if indeed they're sitting, their seating is secure within the parklet and is available, then that could be used for public use, but then it would make a difference between parklets, which might lead to trouble. But something like Positive Pie is a very firm parklet versus Julio's has loose seats. They need to anchor them down at night. So the structure may make the difference. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And that was, I mean, that was basically the difference between our regular ordinance and then the regular, you know, the, the, the ordinance we had required pretty substantial structures. Um, and that was based on lots of things, including guidance from VTrans. Last summer, ACCD and VTrans relaxed those standards because of the pandemic and allowed basically just a platform with something around it and tables and chairs out, you know. And so, it, you know, the, the construction standards changed. So the, one of the questions going forward is going to be, what's the state going to allow for construction standards? What are we going to allow even if, you know, would we want to continue, you know. So I think there's, as we go to the future, we're going to have a lot more questions. But I think for this summer, we're still under the, the same rules. 
So just to check, um, any other uh, members of the public want to weigh in on this? Okay, so I'm gonna close the public hearing. Uh, and is there um, a motion about setting second reading? Oh, that again? Sure, I'll make a motion for a second reading um, to be scheduled for our next regularly scheduled city council meeting, which I believe is March 10th. March 10th. Okay, uh, we've got a motion and a second um, from Lauren. And uh, is there any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. Okay, so uh, that passes. And so we will take that up again on March 10th. Awesome. Um, I think that is the end of our regular business for the evening. So we are on to council reports and I'm gonna go in our normal order. So uh, as long as Donna, you're okay with going first. I always feel- Sure, I'll try to be brief. I'm so disappointed in us. We filled the whole evening, folks. <laughs> We've gotta stop talking so much. Uh, but I would think it'd be neat would go with Lauren's suggestion of getting people with parklets to pull in their advertising with my ride. And we can help them do that. I think that's a great idea, Lauren. And I just wish all the people running for election on town meeting day the best luck, and particularly my fellow council members. I hope you're all here, March 10th meeting. <laughs> I really salute all of you and uh, wish you the best. Thank you. Uh, Connor. Well, I second down on everything, especially the fact that everybody's a big chatterbox tonight. Um, but uh, now I, I wanted to take a moment. Um, I, I'm not very athletic, but I, I decided to throw on some cross country skis this weekend and go over by North Branch. And, and uh, you know, I, I like to talk to people as you're you're on the trail there. And I probably spoke to five different people who said, "My God, like look at these trails that we're skiing on here. Um, we're so fortunate to have a parks department that takes care of this. This is part of like the reason I moved to Montpelier." So in a time when we're all shut in and like 40% of us are like, you know, renters in Montpelier living in apartments that might not have a backyard. Uh, the parks department is always there for us. I was up, uh, up at the old shelter with my, my little dog, who's one of my only friends during the pandemic. Um, and there it is, um, a big bundle of wood already chopped up, ready to throw in the fireplace. So I, I think, you know, times are hard, but the parks department makes it a little more bearable and deserve, deserves a lot of credit on this. So just wanted to take a moment and thank them. So thanks very much. Everybody go out and vote on Tuesday. Yeah, uh, Jay. Yeah, I'll echo uh, Donna and Connor for sure on all those points. Um, and I'll, I'll throw in some more kudos and thanks um, to our Department of Public Works. Um, it's been it's been a rough, I don't know about full winter, but it's been a rough few weeks in terms of uh, the amount of water that has made it from underground above ground. Um, and I've, I've had the unfortunate, uh, op not opportunity, but uh, uh, happenstance to come across two, two leaks right within about two blocks of my house over the last, uh, the last month or so. And, and I painfully uh, email Donna Barlow Casey saying, hey, I hate to tell you this, but this is what I'm seeing. Um, but in, in, in both cases, and I know it's happening all over the city, that they, she, she and the whole crew there have been incredibly responsive and hardworking and really doing their best to manage a number of these issues um, all at once and communicate well with the, the folks that are affected and, and the folks on the block in that neighborhood. And so um, I know it's been a pretty rough stretch, but I just wanted to um, thank them for all their hard work and and, and dedication with trying to keep up with our uh, uh, aged infrastructure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dan. Sure, uh, a couple of points. One is um, I, I talked with Bill this week, but I, I think we should as a council um, consider 
at the end of the winter, um, maybe having a conversation with Public Works about what's been successful this winter and what's not been successful and uh, talking about some of the goals. And, you know, because if we think about Public Works, they work all year round, um, but winter is its most intense and it's always a struggle. Um, you know, if it's not plowing the streets, it's removing the snow banks. Um, and my understanding is that the snow banks downtown are going to be removed in the next couple of days uh, on their cycle. Um, but even those present a challenge because of the, the meters. Um, and so I think we can always be looking to improve that as well. I think every winter, it, it always seems like this is the worst winter for potholes. But I know we've all received comments from people um, that this winter there have been some really some doozies. Um, and I think we need to just continue that conversation because it, techniques change uh, and improve, materials change and improve. And I think it would be good to check in with them at the end of the season before we forget all these. You know, I think as soon as winter's over, we're in a rush to put it out of our minds um, until the next winter. But it would be really good if in April, um, you know, once they're no longer, you know, working 24 seven as they are, it seems in winter to have that conversation. Um, beyond that, you know, I, I'm up for re-election uh, this year, and uh, I certainly hope to be here on March 10th, and uh, I appreciate the support everyone has given um, to me, uh, but in the uh, off chance that um, I'm not, I want to thank uh, everyone uh, for uh, this opportunity. I've spent a lot of years in meetings as an attorney uh, at town meetings in advising municipal governments, uh, but this has been uh, a fantastic experience and I couldn't ask to work with a better group uh, of counselors and uh, per mayor and permanent staff uh, that you know we really have an incredible city here with wonderful resources, with uh, hardworking, dedicated professionals and volunteers. And I can't imagine any community um, where there's a better confluence of both talent and knowledge um, and enthusiasm. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jack. I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, <clears throat> I think I, I certainly remember back in the days when there were two members of the city council who were often referred to in debate as Sherman and Wasserman because they had the same first name. And <laughs> we. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, like, uh, like Dan and Lauren, I'm up for re-election on uh, Tuesday. I hope uh, that uh, the three of us are all returned to our offices. I think I'm very pleased with the work of, of this council. I also do, though, want to thank everyone who has uh, gone out and put their name on the ballot for in any office in the city. It's uh, <clears throat> It's a healthy thing when we have contested elections. Um, and so good luck to everybody. Hope we have a nice, nice weather for, for Tuesday and uh, see y'all later. Thank you. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Um, wanted to note that there are a couple uh, public input opportunities coming up for both the process that we've had ongoing for the um, Social and Economic Justice Committee and the Montpelier Police Review Committee. Um, and they are holding, there's gonna be um, a number of sessions um, focused on some groups of residents such as LBTQ+, uh, BIPOC, people experiencing financial stress, people with disabilities and young people are some of the first groups. So if anyone's, you know, identifies with any of those groups and is interested, um, please, you know, look out. We're gonna be putting information as, as far and wide as we can, um, looking to uh, get as many perspectives um, on both policing and just um, equity issues for our city, you know, as part of our mission to be an inclusive, welcoming, um, and equitable city. So uh, look out for those opportunities. And then there's going to be also just broad public participation opportunities. And I've been really grateful to see um, more, more and more people are coming to the police review committee um, and sharing perspectives 
uh, it's been great to see a lot of um, engagement from from the public um, in that process. So hopefully that keeps up as that work uh, kind of ramps up. Um, one other thing I know, you know, we all got a, a, a note and we all see the the road condition. And I know the issue was raised about, you know, what are we doing and how challenging it's been. And we know that part of our, our budget, you know, we had to make hard decisions about priorities. Um, so just, you know, reiterating, I know that we've talked about, um, you know, obviously looking for any opportunities for federal funding or state funding that might come through to, to ramp up infrastructure investments, or if, you know, we need to get back on track with bonding or other opportunities in the future. Just, you know, I know that it's top of mind for all of us. I just wanted to reassure that we, we see it and, and, you know, having sustainable infrastructure that's safe and in great condition is a priority, I think, of everyone here. Um, and yeah, just wrap up, you know, again, hope to have people's vote so I can be back. But thank you all again. It's been, I love working with all of you, just the, um, you know, everyone's passion for making our community as wonderful as possible comes through both from mayor, counselors, and city staff. And I'm so grateful um, to have been here. Hope to be back, but if not, it's really just been wonderful and so appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, this being sort of in a sense, technically speaking, the last um, council meeting of this session, so to speak, um, I do want to just like take the opportunity to reflect um, and say like, I've, I've been very thankful to work with each of you. Um, and, you know, we don't know what's necessarily going to happen on, on March 2nd. So I do want to also just make sure that I express, um, you know, Dan and Lauren and Jack, you know, I'm very thankful to have uh, worked with you over, over the past. In case you are not here, I want to make sure to, to say that. Um, and uh, also just, you know, looking looking back on the past uh, year or so, like I feel like we have done, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of good work. Um, you know, it's been a, a tough year. And um, I think uh, it's been really helpful to have uh, such a, uh, a group that disagrees well <clears throat> that it is very thoughtful and uh, anyway very very thankful for all of you uh and uh also just want to echo the the gratefulness for for city staff right now um and particularly dpw um i'm just thankful for all for all the work that that they do um taking on a lot particularly this time of year um i had a question i just wanted to uh, verify something with john um, so maybe this is a part of his uh, update, but I'm curious about it. Is it too late to mail in your ballot at this point? Um, so should people be like, what are people's options? <laughs> maybe this is jumping the gun a little bit. So I apologize, but it feels important. So go ahead, John. How can people either get their ballots in or should they show up on Tuesday? Well, I mean, literally speaking, it's never too late. You can mail the ballot whenever you want. It's just you know, you want to be sure it gets there because it's not about the postmark. It's about when I get it in my in my little hands. So, um, you know, I would say if you drop something in the mail tomorrow, pretty good odds we'll get it in time. Uh, if it were my ballot, which reminds me I need to vote, um, I would take it to the drop box behind City Hall because we, we clear that out multiple times a day. I'll be coming in over the weekend and, and clearing it out. And that's just a safer bet. Um, you know, I have had a couple people who really wanted to give it directly to me. And, you know, you could call and we can see about, you know, making an appointment to meet you at the door. But, um, you know, I still really want to encourage people to, you know, to use that, that drop box. Um, right now, the uh, turnout is surprisingly low. It's actually pretty low. Um, I think it, it's not enough to say it's a generality. It's been an axiom that these mail-in elections bring the lower turnout elections up to the level of the highest. So we're completely breaking the laws of nature with such a low response, which is more consistent with our regular city meeting turnout, not even on the high side of that. So either that means it's, it's just going to be a low turnout election, or it means we're going to get a lot of people on town meeting day. Um, so I think folks should be aware of that. 
we still got COVID protocols in, in place. So that means, you know, distancing, that means only letting so many people in at a time, there are going to be lines. And um, if a lot of people show up, then they could be time consuming lines. Um, so I just hope folks will bear that in mind. You know, one of the things that I was hearing from some folks was that they were waiting to vote so that they could uh, gather more information and uh, be able to incorporate you know new information as it as it came up and uh, i thought that was incredibly thoughtful and um and wise uh just as long as the you know the folks do get their ballots in uh in time that that's great um, and would certainly encourage everybody to to do their research on all of the the candidates and all of the items um, for sure so um, thank you again. Uh, and I think um, that's that was it for me. John, is there anything else further you would like to to say as your your turn? <laughs> I uh, was jumping in. Nothing very interesting, so that's fine. Okay. Uh, Bill, go ahead. Um, just to follow up on that, as we did in November, we'll, the rest of City Hall will be closed on Tuesday um, just because there's going to be so many people coming in and out of the building. John, John has got a great system um, of, of getting the people, you know, up one stair, down the other in the front and the people in the back, but just, just out of safety's sake for our employees, we, we won't have the rest of our offices open so people will come wandering in um, just because of the large humanity. There may be a couple of us there working, but we'll be, you know, with locked doors or whatever. Um, so just so you know that, otherwise, I, I think we are not going to do, in November, we then close for two more days for cleaning and all that. And we realized that wasn't that necessary because really the clerk staff had done such a good job of managing access to the building. So um, assuming they're going to do their usual bang up job, uh, we will simply be closed on Tuesday uh, for that purpose. Also allows... Um, some of our staff that don't live here to attend somehow, however their town meetings are being held. Uh, I don't know what they're doing that day, but uh, whether it's virtual or, or not, I guess most of them were just voting. Um, and uh, like like the mayor said, um, you know, we really have three years, three separate years in municipal government, right? We have the, the fiscal year that goes July 1 to June 30, we have the calendar year. And then there's sort of the council year, and that really goes from town meeting to town meeting. That's the 12 months that a particular group is together. Sometimes they have a second 12 months together or a third, but um, every every year with the council is, is a unique experience uh, with that the dynamics of that, those seven people and our staff and everything else. So I certainly thank all of you, but certainly the three of you that for election for serving. Uh, it's a thankless job. Um, and, uh, you know, you get you get to get complained at all the time um, and not really, and basically volunteer for that. And uh, certainly appreciate anyone who runs for election, local government um, requires people to participate. And if people don't step up to run like you all did, then, um, you know, uh, we don't have a local government. So we'll start again in March with a new year. It's, you know, unlike any other Unlike other forms of government, right, where someone gets elected and there's a period of time before they actually start, you know, while they get up, you know, we elect our legislators and everybody and governors in November and they don't start till January, so they have time for transition, time to learn, you know, it's, you get elected uh, on Tuesday and you're the council member that night. That's it. I remember telling one council member years ago, they said, well, when do I take office? I said, let me put it this way. If we have a flood tonight, I'm calling you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, and so, you know, March 10, we'll be up and running and we'll start all of our cycle all over again with uh, thinking about strategic planning and priority setting and organizational meetings and committee assignments and then going through with laying out those, you know, finishing up the agenda items from this last year and then starting with the, the wishes and desires of the new group. So it's always exciting and uh, thank, thank you all for uh, this, this year has been particularly exciting in not so many uh, fun ways, but uh, you all have really made it work great uh, and have been supportive of staff and of each other 
out of a very difficult situation. So we, we appreciate that very much. Okay. And also, just want to congratulate Montpelier alum, uh, city staff alum, Jesse Baker, for being appointed city manager in South Burlington. So that woman is a rocket ship. <laughs> <laughs> Super exciting for her. It's very, yes. very cool. Uh, all right. Well, um, I think that is the end uh, of our business for this evening. So uh, it's 10 o'clock. Uh, anyway, have an excellent evening, everyone. Um, we'll see you later. Okay, night all. Good night. Thanks. Thank you.